This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast. We have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Mountain Glass Arts. For the month of January 2019, Mountain Glass has their monthly borrow sale. They have 45% off Pyrex, no coupon code required for that one. And for all you beautiful soft glass nerds, they have their monthly soft glass sale, 35% off Effetre. Just put in the coupon code Effetre, that's E-F-F-E-T-R-E. And don't forget to check out Mountain Glass constantly for all their weekly sales, as well as kiln sales and everything else going on at Mountain Glass. Any events, anything else going on, or questions, or comments, or concerns, just contact Mountain Glass at mountainglass.com. That's Mountain Glass. Dot com. Hey, 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 what's happening? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 207. This is your host, Jason Michael, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, for those listening to this as this comes out on January 1st, 2019, happy, happy new year. Hope this year is going to be super kick-ass uh, as we reflect on the last year of 2018 and start to focus onward now in 2019. Hopefully this year does not go by as fast as last year, because I don't know about you, but last year uh, seemed like it was about a month long. It was ridiculous. And uh, I know we're all busy constantly doing things, which does help make time go by fast, but hopefully it does slow down a little bit and we get a better pace this year and uh, not get overwhelmed with so much going on. And uh, that being said, today's episode is a new one featuring Jake Zeminski. Uh, he is uh, a overall rounded glass artist. He's been working uh, with glass for uh, about six years now or so. And he it does everything from scientific glass blowing, which he does for a full time job. Uh, he works in a hot shop and also is a lamp worker and uh, pipe maker. And we get into all of those areas of his uh, education background. Uh, from Salem and uh, everything else that he's gone through through the process of being a glassblower. Uh, this also was a fun chat. Uh, him and I have been uh, chit-chatting back and forth for about a month or two now, trying to get him on the show and timing-wise and technical issues on my end, etc. Uh, I don't know about you, the, those that have the new iPhone uh, with that does not have a headphone jack, has that adapter bullshit thing. Because um, I use my phone a lot for for Skype for the recordings and I lost that little adapter and it's like out of sight, out of mind and keep forgetting to go buy a new one. And, uh, so I just figured I would start using Skype and Skype now officially has a new beta test they're running online that you can actually use it on their website. That's high def. And, uh, so we busted it out today and, uh, Jake sounds really good on the show. The definitely appreciate having him on. And, uh, again, we kind of went all over the place. We got sidetracked and took all kind of different paths and turns and, uh, kind of a fun theming of the show though so it was, we had, had a good chat um also we covered some topics of things that happened this year in the world of glass uh from the corning glass barge to uh the gas conference in over in italy this year and then coming to saint pete florida here this year in 2019 which is my hometown and, and i'm super excited that uh they are coming there and i would definitely be there for that and then just uh just kind of overall just you know the ideas of being a well-rounded glass artist and glass blower sculptor whatever you want to call yourself um you know those that have listened to the show a lot i always do preach about really understanding your medium and uh, taking one step at a time as you learn this process and not just being a one-trick pony and uh again there's nothing wrong with being a one-trick pony per se but if you know if that's all what you want to do you know like if you want to be a rig maker or make a pendants or you know whatever it is um as, as long as you have a super strong fundamental understanding of what it is you're making then it's honestly, it's all good in my book. However, I do recommend, though, that you do understand glass in general, so then you can make all kind of things that you want to make and not just be uh, pigeonholed into one little niche of that area of art. Um, so I definitely recommend, you know, just expand your horizons and views and perspectives and trying different things out. Um, 
yeah, so there you go. Uh, some fun things going on. I went on to Mountain Glasses website, seeing if they had updated their sales for January. They have not yet, so I'm going to have to uh, record a little intro commercial ads in the morning before this goes out just to make sure I got you the up to date. So you're listening to this and I'm just talking out loud here. Uh, it'll be updated already. So you'll hear them at the very beginning. Uh, but don't forget Mountain Glass is closed for this uh, day of New Year's Day. They'll be reopened on Wednesday back to regular schedule with them. And they have a ton of sales and fun stuff going on uh, out there. Um, also, the newest Flow magazine issue came out, which is fantastic. Uh, they published my fourth uh, episode or article, I should say, uh, in my series on So You Want to Be a Glass Blower, uh, which is, again, is such an honor to, to be published in an editorial sense uh, that coincides with this podcast. It's definitely a lot of fun. And it's the first time ever that I've been published. And to be published in a magazine like The Flow, it's uh, definitely. It's, in, it's amazing. And this uh, recent episode, or I keep wanting to call it an episode, uh, their recent issue that they have is also uh, incredible stuff. Uh, I mean, just the pictures alone, if you ever want to really learn uh, and see what high quality photos look like uh, for glass, the flow is a great reference point to see. Uh, just the photography alone is incredible. Uh, but they also have a ton of tutorials in there that are step-by-step -step that are done by other glass artists uh, that will share things from, you know, making pendants. Uh, it all really depends on what the uh, particular issue is that you uh, have in hand. And uh, it's just it's just pretty cool seeing it. And uh, this year was the fourth, or this last one they just had out, uh, was the 14th annual Gallery of Women in Glass. And uh, it's just amazing us uh, we've had sabina bame on the show she has a tutorial on there uh nikki knight uh dina kalahar uh, bronwyn Hillman, susan hansen and then again sabina bame um just phenomenal and even just like the cover photo is this incredible amazing chandelier that has a glass corset at the very top uh and there's leaves and birds i mean it's just it's incredible so uh, you know it it's proud it makes me proud to see uh, women in our industry getting the recognition that they're getting. Because in like the pipe world, it's always been very burly, manly, you know, kind of deals. And then uh, the females started to come in and get involved, you know, the lace faces and what have you. And uh, as that part of our community grew, it stopped being so much about the burly, beefy glass blower, and it's now an overall amazing network of a community of talented amazing artists of all races and sexes and backgrounds and religions and everything and that one thing we have in common is this passion for this amazing medium of glass that we all love and hate at the same time so again uh if you had not yet subscribed to the flow magazine i recommend that you do it's a quarterly magazine that comes out and by quarterly, I mean every uh, three months, you'll get a new issue in the mail. They also have a digital version you can get. But if you have not yet subscribed to The Flow, you can go and subscribe today at theflowmagazine.com. And make sure you use promo code WISEGUY. It'll save you 10% off your annual subscription. And WISEGUY is W-Y-Z-G-U-Y at checkout. And I'll have their links in the show notes, too, for that. And I highly recommend it. Um, I, I prefer to actually have it in my hand instead of just a digital copy. Uh you know, it's fun to, to be able to show people physically uh, what's going on in the world of glass. Sure, you can use your phone if you want, but there's just nothing like holding a magazine and uh, getting to show that. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, yeah, what else is going on? I don't know. It's been, a, been 2018 was interesting. Uh, something I definitely wanted to talk about and... Uh, which if you have not yet listened to my uh, Wise Guy Radio Minutes, uh, the last episode I did was all about your why. And I said it was episode five. I'm actually going to be changing that. I got to redo the, like the small intro because it was actually uh, episode four. Episode five of the Wise Guy Radio Minute is going to be about reflection and looking back on uh, the past year of 2018. I know a lot, a lot of folks out there in the world of business and entrepreneurs and stuff are all about setting goals and what have you. And yes, that's important. And uh, but you know, as we all know, New Year res resolutions uh, typically don't really follow through we none of us really do you know the, the the gyms that have memberships their memberships go through the roof for the first three months and then people that were members uh, are still paying for it but they stop going 
And, uh, you know, that can go for anything that we do in life. And what it has to do with really is just changing mindset and lifestyle, whatever it is, and routines. And if you look back on your past year and you had some potential issues in certain areas of your life or in the studio, uh, look back and reflect on the routines and the habits and things that you did that uh, might be the cause for those issues or those routines and habits that you did that were actually... A positive that had a positive impact on your work or on your sales you know like uh, for instance with instagram right now and the way the algorithms are working it's it's almost imperative that you post at least once a day sometimes twice a day just to make sure your followers are seeing your work you know there's millions and millions of people on instagram you may not have that many followers you may have a thousand you may have like i've got ten thousand followers you may have twenty five thousand followers but if you're not posting every day those followers aren't seeing your stuff on a regular basis and those are the kind of habits and routines that you can kind of pick up upon yourself. And, you know, there's also apps out there that you can automate things uh, that will help with those habits and routines. Um, but, you know, it's just it's important, you know, keeping a schedule, keeping a calendar, checking your bank account, making sure your books are just up to date with your business. So, you know, we are now at the end of this or beginning of 2019, which means that taxes are coming up soon, which is our favorite thing to talk about. You know, all these things are super important just to make sure that you're always on top of and paying attention. And, you know, myself, I preach about it all the time and I've been slowly implementing these things into my life myself. Uh, I know if I do it all at once, it's nothing's going to get done. So I've just been slowly creating new routines and habits. And that's really how it is. You can't just do it all at once. You can't lose 10 pounds in a week unless you don't eat anything. And even then, you probably won't lose the weight. You probably gain more weight because you're in starvation mode. So think about it. Think about the baby steps. Think about things you can do in your life that you can every day implement something small even if it's the same thing that the something small is, if you do it for two or three weeks, uh, I don't really know the exact uh, number, but they say I think they say it's about it takes about forty days or something. There's a weird number uh, that it takes for you to uh, somewhat have a routine or habit <sighs> to have a routine or habit uh, set in stone in a sense that becomes a part of your daily occurrence. You know, I mean, think about pooping. You know, if you poop the same time every day, your body knows it. And it's 10 o'clock at night, and that's the same time you poop every day. If you're sleeping, you're probably going to get woken up because you got to go there and take a dump. <laughs> so, you know, and it's a silly thing to talk about, but it's the fucking truth. It's the way our body works. Our body is amazing, and it understands routines and habits. Getting up at the same time every day is important. Even if you go to bed different times every night, getting up every day at the same time is huge. Getting up earlier in the day is a pretty good thing to do because you can accomplish more things in the morning. Even though I know a lot of us are night owls, uh, which for some is good, for some it's not. It depends on your brain chemistry and your makeup and your habits and your lifestyle and everything else. But uh, just think about that. Think about, you know, again, reflecting on this past year. And uh, I'm going to get in more depth again on this with my Wise Guy Radio Minute, along with a little bit of a little PDF you can download uh, to write some stuff down and things to reflect upon that you can have right in front of your face, maybe put it next to your mirror in your bathroom so you see it every day, and just kind of a daily routine habit checklist thing that you can start building upon to uh, just, you know, be the best you. That's what part of my goal with this show is, is helping you become the best you, as well as helping myself become the best me, because as I talk about these things and share these things with you, uh, these are life lessons and things that I'm learning and also implementing into my life as well. So uh, there you go. Nice little ramble for you. Um, uh, yeah, so... I'm going to bounce out of here. Got to go edit the showdown. And then uh, in the morning, I'll throw those ads in for Mountain Glass for their updated sales that they're doing, which hopefully they go out tomorrow morning, even though they're closed. Sorry, I keep yawning. I just had my uh, my interview, and I got to do some jumping jacks and move around to get this CO2 out of my lungs. <clears throat> Otherwise, I'm going to keep yawning. So that being said, don't forget again to go check out mountainglass.com for all their sales updates. Any questions, comments, concerns you have with them, uh, sign up for their newsletter. If you haven't registered with Mountain Glass, just create an account. Uh, they, when you put your email in there, they will then be able to send you updates and stuff on what's going on with all their sales, as well as uh, the, what I talk about here on the show. Um, also, the Flow Magazine. Go check out theflowmagazine.com. 
sign up for their annual subscription and again use the code code wiseguy and that'll help you uh, save 10 percent on your annual subscription uh the patreon page i'm continuing to add content for there and uh would love to grow our community on there and for as little as a dollar a month uh, you can come on there and become part of our community which is only twelve dollars a year i'm sure most of you spend that on a cup of coffee uh, twice a week which i know i do sometimes uh, if you're in the five dollar group you get access to all of our past podcast episodes which are not available on itunes anymore the only 100 episodes at a time are available so the first 105 or so are available through the patreon page and then if you're in the uh, ten dollar tier you now have access to all kind of content and videos and stuff that i am continuously putting up there uh, the recent one i just did last month was uh, just one way and how to make a candy cane in glass so this year, uh, coming up this month, I've got more tutorials, Dragon Wings tutorials, like all kind of fun stuff, as well as wrapping up all the last minute content that I have for the online channel, as well as our YouTube show coming up here, which is going to be launching in two weeks. And I'll talk more about that on the next episode too. So uh, stay tuned for that. I'm going to go ahead and put the link for the YouTube channel in the show notes. So you guys have that. Uh, I don't actually know it off the top of my head right now. Uh, I have like three different YouTube channels that are based on my Gmail accounts. And one for the Wise Guy uh, Media page will be the one we use for the YouTube channel. And that's going to have uh, the series I'm going to be doing with that, just as a little side thing real quick, is going to be for anybody and everybody who's ever wanted to be a glass blower. And every week I'm going to be putting up an episode, about 15 minute long episode. Um, that's going to cover all those topics, everything from uh, getting started, where to find materials, how to set up your studio. Uh, basic beginning things to start making and even questioning whether or not you should actually get into glass blowing or not you know as much fun as it sounds it isn't for everybody so stay tuned again for that i'm going to do a full intro on this uh, topic here in a future episode once i have all my ducks in a row for that so again if you want to help support this show this podcast because this does cost me uh, a little bit of money every month uh, just go to patreon.com forward slash wise guy radio uh, become a wise ass the tier one dollar you get uh, some little goodies as well from me which i uh, have officially ordered and will be on the way and i'll be shipping those out to those who have signed up and joined and uh, until next time hope you guys enjoy this episode with jake again you can find jake on instagram at jake spins glass all one word again his links also are in the show notes and until next time stay uh hydrated and stretch and do lots of good healthy stuff and happy melton have a wise day love you all so much talk to you soon peace What's going on, Jake? Welcome to the show. Hey, what's up, man? Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, man. It's been, uh, as as most episodes happen, it takes four or five times to connect and uh, get things rolling. And here we are now, like 10 years later, finally fucking recording. Hell yeah. New Year's Eve, too. Fuck yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you'll be uh, here in 2019. This will be airing on uh, the 1st of January. So you're number one for the year. And uh, stoked to have you on because you're a multi talented uh glass maker of uh, all sorts and what have you and i'm excited to talk about all facets of glass with you whether yeah, hot shop or, or lamp worker and or talking about beer like we just were or, or whatever <laughs> so we'll see how this goes so it'll probably be off the rails many times and i'll try to keep it on track and uh, until i get way off track here let's go ahead and get you started by you sharing us your uh, superhero origin story and how you're introduced to the flame all right fucking superhero origin story um yeah i was um so I grew up here in like South Jersey, uh, in the swamps, a bunch of farmland, and um, there's a place called Wheaton Village or Wheaton Arts there in Millville, probably about like 45 minutes of where I'm from, and um, I was probably about like 12, 13 years old, and I was going there on the weekends for probably about a year or two, maybe a year, year and a half, and I would just like watch them. This is all hot shop too, and um, I would just watch them blow glass. I had no idea what pipe making was then. I like. Didn't even know what fucking glass was, you know. I was one of those kids who was like, oh, is that the color glass you always work, you know? It's like mm. orange. And, um, <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I heard all the time. But, um, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> but, um, yeah, they ended up, like, 
I was a little gopher after a little while because they're like, oh, you're here all the time. Can't legally get you on the floor. I mean, I guess I probably shouldn't say that. But um, anyway, I was like running around grabbing Frit, you know, helping him out. And, you know, after a while, I just it wasn't there, you know, for probably about two years. Didn't really get like seek into glass again, but always was always interested in it, always on uh, like Tumblr uh, scrolling down and Reddit, you know, scrolling through glass pages. And I started, um, you know, smoking weed and I got into fucking pipes and I saw craving glass for the first time. I was probably about 15, 16 years old. And I was like, what the fuck? Like this pipes are fucking sweet, you know? And then, um, mm-hmm. really dove into it, started looking into glass schools and, uh, graduated high school, went to Salem community college and here I am. Yeah. Hell Been yeah. Long for about five years on the torch. Uh, I have a scientific glass job now, which is cool. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I'm in the hot shop now, so I've been working in the hot shop for a year now. I've taken two semesters. I'm going to be a TA next semester. Nice. Which is cool. So and, are, uh, is that in school that you're doing the uh, hot shop? Yeah, yeah. I so I didn't, I didn't get good grades in high school. I pretty much. Almost failed my senior year, and I wanted to go to school for Hot Shop. I was looking at some universities, and my guidance counselor at the time, she was like, "Yeah, Jake, there's no way you're gonna get into a university. Like, you know, what I mean, your grades are awful, your SAT scores were terrible." And I'm like, "Well, I don't know the fuck I'm gonna do that." And then she's like, "Well, go to Salem Community College. You get in-state tuition. It's ten minutes down the road from your house. You know, they have scientific glass program, they have art program." So I went for the art program, and you know, I took like a bead making class with Amy Lemaire. Who she's a phenomenal person, awesome glass blower too, and um, I just was like, you know what, I don't, I don't really want to do this. I want to make pipes. I want to fucking make pipes. So I dropped out of school, started making pipes, kind of learning myself with my homie Shipley on his back porch, and um, yeah, and then I went back to school, failed some classes. And shit. Oh, well, I'm losing you. You can there? You hear me? Yep, I can hear you now. You're back. So you started, right. uh, yeah, so you uh, dropped out of school, started making pipes, and uh, that was where I lost you. Hey, you actually, yeah, one second, dude, real, real quick. My garbage man just dropped by my house here. Oh, yeah. No, I don't know if you good. can hear him or not. Yeah, I totally can. Sounds like a rocket ship. Yeah, yeah. all of our, <laughs> all of our uh, garbage trucks are all run on, like, hydrogen or some shit. <laughs> like, literally sounds like a rocket <laughs> ship. <laughs> <laughs> They're, like, eco-friendly, but, yeah, you hear them, like, whizzing down the street. It's crazy. The recycling yeah, one's the same way. For a second. Yeah, it's, it's insane. He's going to do That's a U-turn fun. and then come right back by, and then we'll be golden. Yeah, we got, like, a weird alley in the where we have to take our trash out here. They, like, drive down this, like, dirt path through the neighborhood. It's mm-hmm. really strange. Yeah, I had my old, an old house I used to live in was the same way. But we had, like, the giant garbage can, so, like, two neighbors would share that one can kind of thing. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, except for our neighbor was always filling it up. It was classic right there oh yeah totally <laughs> <laughs> all right almost here he comes i should go out there and record it and make it like use it for like a sound effect or something yeah that'd be pretty cool superhero story and then yeah, right there exactly <laughs> here comes the garbage <laughs> truck Yeah, it always figures whenever I hit record, like, a jackhammer will start across the street or something stupid. (laughs) That's the way of the road right there. Oh, man, it never ceases to fail. (laughs) Damn, that thing is fucking loud. Yeah, it says hydraulic hybrid on the side of it. (laughs) Damn. It's crazy. So, anyways, so you're saying, uh, yeah, so you're, I guess it's back up to when you dropped out of school and then you started making pipes. Yeah, yeah, um... So I did some art classes and stuff, and um, and then I I started the scientific. I took the – there's four classes of scientific, so it's only a two-year program, four semesters. So I took the first one, and then after that I dropped out, and I moved to Philly. I had already been making pipes for like, I don't know, like two and a half years at that time, two years. I wasn't ready to do that though. You know what I mean? It was a pretty big jump. Um, I was selling glass, you know, I was – doing my thing i was making making money not really managing it well i was kind of young and just trying to do the damn thing you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and um i don't know i realized you know i want to go back and get this fucking degree getting older i kind of want to 
dwell more into glass. I don't want to just be a pipe maker. You know what I mean? It was um, the scene so saturated. I was just getting getting really distraught with like where I was seeing myself in five years from that moment. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, came back. I just graduated like last month. So nice. Fucking yeah. But I've had a scientific job now for a year, which is pretty cool. And been diving into the hot shop like i've wanted to since the get-go you know what i mean and i'm very grateful to be able to have that opportunity at the school and my job paid for my last semester like they paid for my art class and my scientific shit so nice hell yeah yeah really really fucking grateful for that and yeah here i am i'm just fucking blowing glass man it's i i get anxiety when i'm not blowing glass like if i sit down for a day i'm like what the fuck am i gonna do with myself right now you know yeah man it's i'm the same way i start getting antsy you know it's like yeah. i work a lot at disney but like even at home like right now i don't have any oxygen it's been a pain in the ass getting gas at my house and i'm just like fuck i gotta get some i got people waiting for shit i want to work yeah true that man. even if they're I not like, waiting i want to I still want to <laughs> yeah right i fucking been looking into high volume oxygen recently yeah yeah i'm actually going to be uh bring an oxygen frog back on the show to talk about some of the newer stuff that he's come out with lately he's uh, yeah i know there's a couple of different brands and companies out there i've had i had scott on the show last two years ago and nice, uh nice. yeah so just because he's local here in florida so i wanted to kind of keep him on as a as my go-to in a sense but the dude's super knowledgeable but yeah man it's amazing like my brother just dropped a, dropped some money on a, a system for himself at his house and he's like dude i'm 26 and i'll never have to buy oxygen again i'm like yeah i'm, I'm fucking jealous dude <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's why I want to do it now before it's like almost too late. I guess it's like I don't know. I want to be able to pay it off within a couple of years and be like, cool, I can blow glass, not worry about oxygen ever. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I know a couple it's, of those companies fi- will finance it, and I, I think that they understand the uh, the pipe makers, glass artists don't always have the best credit per se. So I kind of wonder how they how they work that out. You know. Yeah, I was talking to uh, the HVO people, and um, I guess they they have a link. They have a uh, connection with North Star. I'm pretty sure. Okay. I'd have to like read the email, but North Star does a um, a financing thing for you too. Nice. Yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, I have to check that out for sure because that'd be something interesting to uh, just to bring up on the show to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For those that need it, because you know it's like I used to pay like back in the day I was paying like twelve bucks for a tank, and then I started paying eighteen, and then with twenty five, and now this like local company, and they're a mom and pop, so they're small, but they're like thirty five bucks to fill for a small K oh, tank, you know? And it's like damn, and I can't complain because I've had other artists on that live at like in Hawaii and Alaska, and they're paying like a hundred dollars for a fucking tank. For a K tank? Oh, dude, yeah. If you go back and listen oh, to, oh my god, yeah, go back and listen to some of the episodes. Yeah, it's Jesus uh Christmas. What the fuck? Yeah, it's crazy, right? Yeah, Jupiter Nielsen I had him on and he was talking about like just like the liquid oxygen's insane. And just by chance, man, he was somewhere I don't know if it was at dinner or at a Starbucks or whatever, but he was talking about the with another glass artist about the prices of, te- of gas or something like that. And just by chance, um some dude was next to him and there he started talking to him about it and about the prices and um the guy ended up being like I think he was like the vice president for air gas some shit like oh, that shit. and was and and somehow you know through the conversation jupiter kind of you know let them know what they're dealing with and the guy cut all their prices in half over there i mean they're still paying an arm and a leg but they're not paying you know two arms and two legs anymore yeah right that's fucking stellar that's a nice connection to have yeah it's pretty interesting it's like <laughs> the you never know who you're talking to kind of story you know kind of thing yeah right yeah i think i'm paying um me and my shop mates we're paying like 120 a tank for liquid and then uh, it's like sixty-seven bucks a month for rent. I'm pretty sure. So it's yeah. not that bad, honestly, compared to these prices you're telling me right now. Like, holy yeah. shit! Do they have you? Because I know, like, my old auction place, they would have it to where if I can get the tank back before the end of the month, they wouldn't actually charge me the rent. So I'd have like a two-day or three-day leeway. It was always oh nice. no, they 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 hit us with it no matter what. Yeah, right on. Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. We we go through a tank a month, pretty much. You know, we all have job like full time jobs, so it's like, I'm only in the studio. I I work four tens, so I'm in the studio Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. Um, I don't really have time to get in there after work, man. It's like I wake up at five in the morning, I get home at six at night, and then you know I, I got to be up. I go I go to bed at like nine thirty. But it's nice to just get those four days out of the way, and then I have three day weekend where I can be in the studio fucking. 10 hours a day if I want or you know what I mean yeah yeah it's killer yeah so, man so with the scientific job so you go from Salem you get your degree you get out and now you got this job which you had I guess while you were still in school so like in terms of the stuff you're doing like what kind of uh, 
what kind of scientific glass are you making? Yeah, so it's um it's not really apparatus work. Um like, you know, like all these other apparatus companies where I'm making like distillation, like short path distillation stuff and reactor units and stuff like that. Um we make a lot of uh, we do a lot of kovar like glass to metal sealing and okay. a lot of like gradient seals, which is really interesting. It's that's they don't teach that at the school because it's too expensive to teach. Um which I'm actually pretty grateful to also have that glass skill set under my belt now. Um, but yeah, it's cool. Um, we make stuff for CT machines, dental X-ray machines. Um, I'm pretty sure like other X-ray machines. Uh, there's a guy there that makes these glass to metal uh, gradient lasers and shit that ship out to Japan. It's fucking wild, dude. Yeah, they're insane looking. Um, and then we have a quartz room. They make they make little tiny parts and fuel injectors and stuff. Um, I know uh, we. I don't make them, but I know we make uh, little parts that go inside of um, what are they called? Night vision goggles for the military. Huh. So yeah, I actually just found that out at our work party um, before the holiday. I was like, damn, I didn't know we did that shit. That's cool. So yeah, yeah, it, it's actually interesting stuff, you know. Um, and there's, dude, South Jersey is kind of a mecca for scientific glass jobs. There's like ten glass houses around here. Oh, huh, interesting. Yeah, it's it's a pretty cool spot. I mean, it's dead. Like I said, it's the armpit of the armpit of America. Yeah. We're living down here in the fucking swamp. But it's a pretty barren area. But I don't know. I, I grew up here. I'm pretty used to it. Yeah, but man, it's, really it's just ba- it's badass. So just just to, a bill like you're, you know, you said it's a blessing to have what you have. You know, the opportunity to, to make a living and have a job that's a nine to five, and a, even though you're doing 10 hour shifts. But, you know, still, it's, it's pretty badass, especially right out of school, man. It's like. Nowadays, yeah, it's fun, man. Yeah, it's not that easy. No, for sure. And it's like I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to have this this job. You know what I mean? I, I honestly never saw myself doing that. You know, I want to be an artist one day. I want to just fucking be able to quit my job and do my own fucking thing and be me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Make my own schedule, work my own time, and make what I want to make. But you know, I just got to, You know, you only live one life. Why not experience? experience at all right oh yeah man and and having done that myself for like 13 before i uh years before i did the got my gig at the mouse house i definitely appreciate having something that's regimented now where i have a schedule this is what i do and i know what's going in what's going out you know what i mean instead of yeah, just that sure. always like okay who am i gonna call today or you know it's it's especially right now the pipe industry is in such as it's still i keep bringing up all the time it's in such as weird flux and personally not having my myself involved with it because I, I haven't made a pipe in almost a year now um so it's which has been interesting for myself personally but that being said for those that are involved in the in the industry they're, they're, it's just it's volatile as hell right now oh yeah no for sure it's um like since i had this job to be honest i haven't really focused too much on my marketing and making sales like left and right um whenever i'm in the studio i'm still i'm still making pipes i love making pipes don't get me wrong you know Mm -hmm. um that's honestly every time i hop on the torch i'm like what am i gonna make today and then next thing you know i got a rig in the kiln or like you know some spoons or something just having a fun day yeah but um yeah i don't know i noticed i did auctions for a while and i still do auctions every once in a while but when i post like one-off pieces i've been sitting on shit since may you know what i mean and i don't really hit up shops anymore i don't really want to sit there and do proto on my weekend after doing proto at my job all mm-hmm, week. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I don't know. I give, I give, dude, I give pipe makers props, like full time pipe makers. I get it's a hard fucking living, man. Especially like you were saying, the the market's pretty saturated. I feel like, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I think though, like with you know, I bring my brother up just because he's a, just for my reference because he's kind of my connection right now to the industry and like he's been in this now for seven, eight years and he's still doing production. And he, and he talks to these new glass blowers that come into these studios that he's working out of. And they're like, they can make rigs, but they can't push a bowl or make a, or pull a point or make a spoon. And it's like, I think it's going to like, and I preach about it all the time in the show is just, everybody needs to go back to like the basic fundamentals to oh, really understand it, you know? Cause like the, the, with the way technology is going and the new, digital stuff and the electronic devices i mean puffco was awesome to de- create this device that holds a glass rig you know so that now is, you gotta yeah. you know and in your sense you know you being a scientific glass blower you can understand the principles of what it takes to make something like that and to have it fit another you know 
container in a sense. But if you don't have those basic fundamentals, then you're going to be fucking lost. You're not going to really understand what you need to go, what direction, what move to make, whatever to, to get to the point to where you can make something that's going to adapt to where the future of this industry is going. Because with the medical field, I mean, it's, it's, so, it's still so the Wild West. I mean, in Florida, they're just now trying to figure out the legalization you know, with medical here, but also to get the, the flowers on board. We've had tinctures and oils and stuff, but... You know, it's, it's kind of weird. And then the laws that we're going to be dealing with, potentially the pipes in this area, like I've been talking to a couple of friends of mine who are, are involved in the industry right now with medical marijuana, and they're, they're concerned for the pipe maker here because they may not be able to sell pipes um, or the smoke shops, in a sense, legally might get to a point to where they can't sell these fucking pipes because the dispensaries are going to be the only ones that can sell them. But then the dispensaries can't sell the pipes. They have to give them away as like a dispensary using device uh, you know what i mean it's it's this weird kind of uh, it's just weird a lot of a lot of really weird gray area right now in this whole industry colorado seems to have it figured out but even colorado is still you know every glass blower in the world moved to colorado so now they're like you know super saturated no yeah for sure i mean i was talking to a buddy the other day and i don't know how you feel about this and i don't know how like people listening would feel about this but i i have a feeling that you know if weed gets legal you know, across the board, medical or recreational, whatever. I have a feeling it'll hurt the the pipe industry more, to be honest. Because oh, I feel I like there's yeah. going to be a heavier influx of import glass. All of these shops are. I feel like there's going to be more shops popping up, and like more people are going to want to be blowing glass. And which is, I think everybody should fucking blow glass. But I, I don't know. I feel like it would. I feel like it could hurt the market even more than where it's at right now. Yeah, I'm. Uh, what my biggest thing with the import stuff right now, because like for instance. The new tariffs and taxes that are being uh, being uh, initiated right now, stuff coming in from China and whatever, um, it's expensive now to have stuff brought in, and like it's even so much so, like with our with my company at where I work at the Mouse House, we're stopping the use of the Chinese glass, and I love this stuff just because of the different diameters that we can get, but it's expensive to get it in, and it's not cost effective for us. So we're talking to like Abe over at Northstar to see about getting custom batches made of certain sizes, you know, of certain types of, you know, colors that we need that we work on a regular basis with just because the yeah, imports sure. and the tariffs are expensive. So I'm, you know, mm. but I know that, you know, at the same time, I'm not going to bring up any names, but companies that have been importing their quote unquote American made glass for years, I don't know how they're getting it across and not, not having to pay that tax and then making it still cost effective enough for them to still do that. You know what I mean? No, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, Maybe I maybe my insight on that could be wrong. You know what I mean? I hope I you know I get China glass the fuck out of here. Honestly, like I mean I don't I don't mind the raw material and American artists making it, but I I don't know, man. I feel like it, it definitely hurts the market. It hurts the full time pipe maker to have shops just selling China glass. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I, I guess it, again it goes to marketing and pricing and how you deal with you know what you deal with it. I mean, I can go on for three days about this topic, but uh. Yeah, but, I'm dude. I'm the worst marketer ever. <laughs> I'm horrible marketing my work. I'm like, it's pretty bad, honestly. Like some of my friends and shopmates are like, "Oh, what are you selling that for?" And I tell them, and they're like, "No, you should either price it higher or price it lower." And I'm like, "Dude, I don't even know. I just want to make the damn thing and fucking get this out of my face." You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's like I don't know. That's probably why it's better off. I have a fucking full time job. <laughs> oh no, dude, totally. Because not everybody is, has the acumen for business, you know. But just yeah, kind of on, I definitely don't. Just on a side note, for like for yourself, like when, when I started doing this, I always made sure like that my profit margin was about twenty bucks an hour, you know, as if I had a job somewhere right. else. So I just always, you know, figure if I can make four spoons an hour and I can sell them wholesale for five bucks a piece or say six bucks a piece or whatever, and it cost me a dollar to make them, there's my 20 bucks an hour I can make profit. And that's kind of how I priced myself. And then the longer I was in this, the higher I would raise my hourly wage based on, you know, the industry and what I was making and whatever. So if you make for one sure, pipe an hour, sure. you know, you make the wholesale that thing for 50 bucks. But then yeah. at the same time, you know, if you're under, underselling yourself too, just based on the market value, you know. Yeah, but it's also good to go, know, go scout, go scout the shops, check out prices. Yeah, I dude, I did that for I did do that um, when I was living in Philly. Me and my me and my shopmate, we went to a few shops here and there, and we would we would do that scout the scout prices and stuff, and try to make connections. But I don't know when I when I came back, I fell I fell out of it. I was like, I just don't even want to deal with it anymore. 
honestly. And that, that yeah. sounds like, I guess, um, unmotivated in a sense, but it's not like I stopped blowing glass. I'm well, still they, blowing glass. Well, yeah, and that's the day. thing, dude. You don't have to. And, you know, again, going back to the fact that you have this gig and myself too, and those that have a full time glass blowing job, it's a blessing because you don't have to go home and do production unless you want to. And my generation, my mindset is still like, production 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 it's hard for me yeah. you know it's hard for me to want to come home and to be like okay what kind of one-off am i, am I making today which is again it feels why good I, when you make that one-off too man you put that in the kiln yeah. when you're done you're like damn it's been a long day but i just made something unique and beautiful yeah, for totally. myself you know it's a nice release of energy just get in that flow state and just fucking move yeah exactly and that's you know that's that's one thing i miss because i don't get that at work really because i i'm always chit-chatting with guests and stuff you know so i'm, I'm kind of right. like in both both realms at the same time so yeah i definitely miss miss the getting at home and throwing my headphones in and leaving the studio for a couple hours in a sense yeah it's definitely nice i i love it in the hot shop too man when you get in that flow state like yeah. me, i've had the same uh assistant when i'm in my blow slots slots and i'm gaffing uh, my homie Nick, man, he's a fucking man. Uh, he assists me, and we've gotten to the point in the last year where, if we're make say we'll, we'll be busting out like you know tumblers or something, just like making cups, and we, it gets to the point where we don't even talk to each other. We have music on, and he knows the next step that I need him to do for me, and I know what he's going to need me to give him in that moment. You know what I mean? We have a, such a flow state going. Yeah. It's it's fucking awesome. Yeah, that's one of the things with the hot shop that always intrigued me before I actually got myself into the hot shop was just kind of this it's a, it's an unspoken kind of choreographed dance that's going on the whole time where everybody exactly. has their position in the role and you know, it's exactly. it's dangerous environment and everybody's got to watch out what the fuck's going on, but everybody's on the same same wavelength in a sense. It's intense, man. The hot shop is fucking intense. And I love it. That's I don't know, when I'm in the hot shop, I'm like, "All right, cool. I'm ready to sweat my dick off." I'm ready to make some fucking art with my friends right here. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. we're all just having a good time. Just a whole crew just blowing glass at each other, making this, making one piece together collaboratively. Yeah, like, exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah. Now, do you find like early on when you were doing the assisting, you know, in the hot shop, like all these little steps and stages throughout your early career in a sense, before you, you know, and then you went to school and stuff, do you think that all kind of culminated to where you, when you got out of school, that you still had a, you had a better like mindset and perspective of glass in a sense. Does that make, does that make sense? Kind of. Um, are you saying like comparing? Well, just kind of like, you know, like if say, like whenever I would have somebody uh, apprentice or take classes for me, I always had, they had to watch for nine hours. That's like a, for what, that's a not weird number, but I do three, three hour sessions and oh yeah, just so they can watch and visually see what the hell is going on. So that when you get into the process of actually turning a torch on, you're kind of familiar with what's going on, sort of, you know, just visually speaking. Physically, you still have to get the muscle memory and stuff going, but your brain is already kind of wrapped around some concepts. So No, for sure. Yeah. Like, when I, <clears throat> when I first got in the glass, even when I, you know, had my own torch and everything and I was blowing glass, I still, before I even wanted to make something, I was like, I need to watch somebody do this, you know, or, or watch somebody, like, do something like it. I'm a, I'm a very visual and hands-on learner. I can't read something or have somebody just tell me it i mm -hmm. need to like see it done so yeah i mean assisting in the hot shop if that's what you, is that what you were asking like yeah um, yeah before you, yeah because yeah, then so, you went from that to school to scientific glass blowing which is a whole nother animal i mean you're using you know machines to help hold the glass in a sense compared to the hot shop so even though you weren't actually physically melting glass you know yeah i had i had had a very 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 tiny hot shop experience when i was like 14 you know 14 years old at wheaton mm -hmm. But um, when we went to at the school, man, they just throw you in. They're like, you know, we had a, my teacher, um, Danny. She's awesome. She works up at Urban Glass in Brooklyn. Um, she, she, you know, we hopped in first semester glass blowing. She's like, all right, we're all gonna gather today. I'm gonna show you twice how to do it. I'm gonna show you how to marver out a punny. Go fucking do it. You know. Yep. And um, yeah, not not a lot of uh, demonstration. It's kind of just like a one step go. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's how my hot shop was too. When I worked with uh, Charlie, he he uh, same way. He yeah, was, my he, bad yeah. if I it didn't answer the question properly, but oh no, no, it did. I, I'm just kind of curious because it seems like you know, in our, in life in general, you know, as we grow and we do, we're exposed to all these things. Hopefully, all these things we're exposed to can kind of all come together to help us fine tune a passion or job or whatever. You know what I mean? And For sure, so, and I I really feel like. Um, being being uh like flame working for five years and then getting into the hot shop 
I had I had a I feel like I had a better understanding of the hot shop just just knowing fluidity of glass and to an extent you you know um, obviously furnace glass is way fucking different than melting boro but yeah. still just like having that understanding and then after the year of hot shop um, and progressing in hot shop and then taking what I my knowledge of hot shop into the flame studio I've I've been able to it's like they've both kind of piggybacked each other to help me. I don't know, get better in a sense. I, oh, I no. I can, and I, I recommend anybody that's a flame worker to take hot shop classes just because not only the hand oh, skills that you get, but like for me, it, it allowed me to understand glass even more so intimately. So now, like when I go to my torch, I can get bigger and hotter and, and you know, whatever in Boro yeah. now, you know? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, dude, I, the way I think about it, it's like, you know, nothing against just like anybody who does one specific um, role in glass. Like, if you're just a hotshot worker, if you're just a pipe maker, if you're just a non-functional uh, flame worker, you know what I mean. Or if you're mm -hmm. if you're just a kiln caster, or if you're just a scientific uh, glass worker, I think if you're a glass blower, you should try all fields of glass. You know what I mean. You you have to. I I don't know. I, if you don't, I feel like you're just missing out. You're missing out on the world and the the world of glass i completely you know? agree yep 100 like you got it you got to try it all at least because you never know man what, what if you've been making pipes for like 10 years and then you're like oh i'm gonna try this hot shop class that's like at this hot shop you know an hour away and you fall in love with it. you're like okay i have a change of, of path with my life right now i need to fucking manifest this so you never know, man. I mean, life's crazy. You just I think if you have, are a passionate glass blower, you should try all fucking fields. Without yeah, a doubt. completely. And and you know, it's it's interesting too because there's so much crossover that you can happen. Like for instance, like there was one day I was making pumpkins, and I go into my mold, and my bottom was too thin, so I popped it open, not realizing it, just getting that bubble going and getting the mold texture picked up in the optic mold. And I was like, it was the first time it ever happened to me, and it was a big, massive glass. Like I, the pumpkins I was making were the small ones were about four inches, and my big ones were eight inches in diameter, and it's a that's a nice. big big ass pumpkin you know yeah <laughs> so i'm like well what the fuck do i do and and when we do our demos at at disney it's a solo show so which is interesting on its own doing it being a solo hot shop worker oh and you're making solo you're doing it's all solo. solo yeah totally nice yeah dude it was interesting timing wise but uh you know yeah, you gotta be quick I, yeah it's interesting yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's understanding a lot you know but uh I look at it and I, I go to my bench and I'm like, well, I could take my diamond shears and neck this down and cut it maybe, or I can go to my bench, I can go back in my glory hole, get this bitch hot, go to my bench and then marver it on my bench like I would if I was on the torch. Right. So, so that's what I did. So I went to my, you know, got it hot, marvered it down, did a little air trap to some, move the, some glass around. I went back to my bench and removed a little bit of the glass, but not as much as I would have had to if I had gone straight to the bench just to remove that shit or to close it back off. And it, it made me realize, like, the, the, just the crossover ideas of, well, if I can do this on the torch and with this glass over here, why can't I do it over here with this kind of glass? Exactly. You know, and it doesn't always yeah, work, sure. but it, it, it was uh, it was cool, man. Like, even trying to do some, like, wigwag, you know, back and forth kind of switchback patterns on in, in the hot shop, it didn't always come out the way I wanted it to, but it was still fun as hell trying to get a wigwag pattern in that, you know, in it. Hell yeah, that's tough, man, trying to get twists like that in the hot shop like yeah. i don't know i don't know how you do it but um what like do you do the marver tech where you just spin in one place yeah on your marver yeah and dude that shit's hard especially if you want to get a wigwag pattern you got to like make sure you're heating the right spot in and out of the glory hole right there it's that's just tough yeah for sure and, and i think the one thing you know in terms of the the biggest thing i learned from the hot shop was like heat base and understanding like really having consistency in heat and glass because it's, you know, it's amazing, man. If you go to heat something up and there's like one small spot, in, like if you're on the torch and there's one small spot of, of just the tiniest like dime size area that isn't as evenly heated as the rest of your piece and you go to blow it out, you're going to know that that spot was cold. Oh, yeah, for you know? sure. And then, and getting to use a glory hole and that encapsulates the glass with all the heat compared to a torch, you know, it's it was a, it was a definitely a unique experience and, and learning lesson as well. Not to mention trying to understand how to work glass with only using really one side of the glass you know where like you know on the torch you have your blowpipe and your punny or whatever you're doing right <clears throat> you know it's like for, and you can just constantly switch back and forth if you need to you know what I mean? yeah exactly yeah and like the like for me like I, the first time i ever did any lathe work it was it was frustrating but it was also a little boring for me because i wasn't used to just like standing there with a torch in my hand but it made me appreciate the the, the, uh, the uh, lathe workers because you're not dealing able to 
adjust your pitch you have to you're always working on a flat plane in terms of using gravity right. you know yeah for sure that's all i do at work is on work on the lathe yeah so it gets, it gets it, pretty boring but <laughs> it's a production job and you know yeah are you able to throw some headphones in and do your thing or is it like oh yeah dude i could sit there and like watch netflix if i want to oh nice yeah they're they're really cool people man they treat me really well there i'm i'm grateful to have that job you have uh, benefits and stuff through them yeah yeah 401k benefits hell yeah yeah, it's pretty cool. It's cool. I'm like a wook, so I don't know. Uh, it's kind of weird being there, I guess. But <laughs> you know, I work with a bunch of old head glass blowers, so they're, they're a lot of them. There are savages, man. Oh yeah, but man. That's how they are, really dude. Phenomenal glass blowers, though. You know, like really good glass blowers. Yeah, I was watching. I don't, his... don't even know what the pipe scene is. You know, it's oh crazy. completely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like what, what's what's pipe making? Right. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, but yeah, like there's those OG fucking scientific glass blowers are like old school hot shop workers man like you're saying they're just beasts oh yeah they don't take shit either that's for damn sure yeah yeah it kind of uh, hardens you a little bit <laughs> definitely <laughs> it definitely apartment. does <laughs> <laughs> you kind of have to you know yeah there's some people in my job who are hard headed and like I don't know if you do something wrong they're gonna fucking tell you they're gonna be straight up with you that's for damn sure yeah, which is important, not being afraid to. Uh, oh no, and it's going to make you a better glass blower, man. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because not everybody can handle the criticism. That's another thing with glass, man. I feel like there's a lot of negative, um, not negative. I would I should say a lot of criticism in the glass scene right now that I've noticed on the internet, and people are kind of taking it to heart. And it's just like, dude, just do your thing. Just blow glass. Like, take it. Don't take it as some heat coming your way. Just take that heat and then manifest that within yourself to put something else better you know what i mean yeah. like work better for work to make something better you know yeah it's just being using perseverance and getting past the bullshit and a lot of times the criticism out there is honesty from people that don't know any better maybe you know yeah no, that's true yeah but same time like with us at work we have an art director and she's a ball buster on stuff and it's like you know certain specific things that are character work that have to be a certain way before we can even go out and get them approved, like this, my recent character I've been working on took, I mean, it literally took me six months and 12 revisions till I got to a point. And the 12 revisions are ones that went to her, not even the ones oh, that damn. I fucked up on before, you know, and thinking they were good enough to send it off to the office. So it's, you got to, like, it's, it's self defeating. It can feel, you know, at times. And it's, you know, it's like the, like the, the successful people out there always say, it's like when you get to that point to where you're hitting the wall, if you just stop right there, you never know what's going to be on the other side of that wall. Exactly. You got to fucking – dude, I tell myself all the time, it's like, you know, life's a ladder, right? And it's like some some pegs are going to be missing. You know, it's going to be cloudy on your way up. It's going to be stormy, but you just got to keep fucking climbing. You got to climb through the bullshit. You just got to jump the pegs and just keep on moving because that ladder's not getting any fucking smaller. So you got to fucking move. Yep, exactly. Yeah, it's so true, man. You know? And yep. it's like yeah. uh, with the with like the criticism and shit too. It's you know at my job specifically, everything's got to be to a spec, and it's like to thousands of a millimeter, you know. And it's like I'll have I'll, the inspectors will come back and bring you know defective parts to me, and I'm like, oh shit, like well, I got to fix them. But sometimes, man, if you get a new job and you really fuck up that job without you know you make like a hundred parts and you're you know forty of them come back. You know, your boss is going to be like, yo, dude, I'm going to write you up. Like, I have to. You, you got to fix these or I have to write you up. And that's no bueno. Yeah. So that, that's another part of it. It's like you got to really fucking pay attention and focus on the finer things. You know? Yeah. It's, it, and it's all in the details. And like a lot, of th a lot of things that I've been learning within the last couple, like say like the last year really in terms of my glass is really all about cleanliness and how important – it is to have clean glass like when you store it when you keep it in your studio whatever you're doing and before you use it no matter how well it's stored and kept out from collecting dust you have got to keep that shit clean oh no for sure dude at my job we like we have acid bath washes and everything for we have to wear gloves like can't touch the glass it's it's a little more intense than i would have it at my home studio you know what i mean but yeah we you definitely got to have clean glass yeah, Definitely. man. Hey, give me one second, dude. I need to close this window. I got somebody outside with the. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, know. you're good. Yeah, I've got a house under construction right now from uh, right, literally across the street, and there's the uh, was the septic guy cleaning out the porta potty. <laughs> nice. Yeah, this guy's. Uh, it's actually kind of interesting. This guy's construction. He's uh, 
right now the entire house is being built with foam, like foam blocks and structure wise. And it's got uh, like iron or metal bars in between the foam. <clears throat> and then I guess they're going to fill like the inside internal parts of the foam with concrete and then they'll spray the outside of it or whatever. Like what? That. I've never heard of that. That's I, crazy. I know. I've never. I, I've seen like Adobe style homes being done that way, but not like this. This is this is pretty cool shit, and it seems like it's like ideal insulation too. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I don't know anything about construction, unfortunately. Yeah, I just kind of. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> I pretend sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, I could build a bench to blow glass on. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> right. I guess that counts or something. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. So kind of back up a little bit when you're, you know, we're starting to do your flame work and stuff. What were some of the first things you were making? Oh, dude, fucking. Um, so like the first six months I was on the torch, I was just making hollow tube implosions. I like looked up a video on YouTube, uh, you know, how to make a, a pendant pretty much. I don't really quite remember exactly, but I remember stumbling across some dude's home, home video that you could barely see what the hell he was doing. And um, I just gave it a shot. Like, you know, start blowing bubbles and putting dots on it and imploding it. And I did that for like six months and I just made pendants. And uh, I really, I told myself, I was like, you know, if I'm going to really dive into this, I need to fucking figure this out and get this as good as I can get until I feel comfortable enough to move on to the next step. Smart. So I did that and I just did pendants and so went to a couple, uh, you know, uh, fairs, craft fairs with my shop made at the time and we sold pendants and shit. And, uh, then I started making spoons, and they were so shitty, and I was, I got down on myself, honestly, a lot. But uh, they got better, you know, and then I don't really know when I started making rigs and stuff, but it's kind of all I make now is rigs and, you know, one-off spoons, and I make a lot of one-off stuff, you know. I don't really like to focus on production. I just like to, I don't know. Yeah. Well, again, like, you don't, you don't have to, which is... Awesome. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even when I had to, to be honest, man, I I still made what I kind of wanted to make. If it didn't sell, I was like, shit, I'm going to be late on a bill then. But I just want to blow glass. It's, I want to make what I want to make and let my passion kind of do its thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like old Bob Snodgrass says, uh, you know, money follows passion. Dude, damn straight. That is for sure. That is definitely for sure. Yeah, speaking of Snodgrass, I didn't get his ass on the show. That would be awesome. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah, absolutely. I would like to hear what he has to say about fuming because I can't fume to save my life. <laughs> I really can't. It is <laughs> burn it out. I could get it on the glass, but then as soon as I start, I definitely overheat it because as soon as I start making something, by the time I look at the finished piece, I'm like, oh, cool, it's just clear. <laughs> it's all flame composition, dude. It's amazing how many times I put silver on a piece of tubing and it was clear, and then I just kind of like jack up my propane a little bit, and then it's like super saturated in silver like i didn't realize how much silver was on the piece damn it's yeah weird. i gotta i have to talk to some homies some of my homies they do a lot of fuming i definitely want to that's something i want to get into because that's another thing i kind of feel stuck with um what i've been doing on the torch recently i haven't really dwelled into something new flame working wise i feel like that has a lot to do i've been like busy with work and school but i don't know i feel like my progression has kind of plateaued within this last year well, it's good that you recognize that, though, you know, because not, yeah. everybody, not everybody does. Yeah, I try to, I don't know, I just want to be the best glass player I could possibly be, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, it's important for sure. Yeah. The, you know, so I guess my question for you, though, is why are you making rigs? Uh, I just like making them. Is and it? honestly, I, I I, mean, I don't just make rigs. I, I you know, I make spoons and I'm a weird one-off Sherlock hammer-looking pieces uh -huh. and, um, you know, uh, I did dwell into sculpting for a while, too. Um, I mainly make rigs, though. I auction a lot of clear rigs. That's kind of what I do um, recently. Um, I did a lot of that last year, too, and they did good. You know, I'll, I'll make a clear rig with a factory joint and, like, you know, an opal on the back or a color horn or, you know, an implosion cab. And they usually go for, like, 100 120 bucks. So, And that's what they retail for. If I wholesale them, I'll wholesale them for, like, 65 70 and then... You know, they retail in 120. Nice. Um, I don't know if that's good because, I, like I said before, I'm a fucking horrible at marketing <laughs> and when it comes to business. But Well, if it was like five years ago, I'd say you're underpricing yourself. But nowadays, it's uh, the prices have definitely gone down a lot on, on specific yeah. things, especially on clear stuff. I, oh, yeah. I was just kind of curious asking just because of your scientific background. I wasn't sure if it was like, you know, the scientific connection because it's, it is a scientific type of process. 
Yeah, like you have your insertion seal, and then because I don't do, I normally or ring seal. Well, it's a, technically it's an insertion seal with what I do because I don't have um, I don't have a brace on the bottom of my downstones. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So yeah, insertion seal, side seal joint. That's pretty much the only scientific aspect to it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Taking those scientific classes has has definitely helped me with my pipe game for sure, like one hundred ten percent. Because the stuff we do is all standard wall, and you're you're constantly doing ring seals, constantly doing side seals, tangential seals, you know, insertion seals, fucking making condensers, and you know, doing distillation shit. It's you know, like our chemistry project. We uh, I made a um, we had to extract limonene from orange peels, and uh, we made a separation funnel, and on top of that was an Allen condenser, and that was really cool. That, that doing that project really helped me grow an appreciation for the scientific aspect of glass. Because you know, when you're a scientific glass player, you just kind of unless you're working at a university, you know, like Mike Souza or somebody, you're um, you're making the apparatus and you're just shipping it out. And then tomorrow's a new day of work. You know, yeah. you don't really get to see what goes into that apparatus and what's being created. You right. Know? Yeah. That was that was fun talking with Souza because like you know they they'll take them and blow his stuff up to make sure but doing pressure tests and stuff you know and then he goes back and makes adjustments and he's dealing with like microns you know measurements which is yeah it's shit's crazy yeah. he comes to salem all the time dude he's he did a demo at the ifc like there's a lot of crazy good glass blowers that come through salem all the time heck yeah yeah i got Susan, and stuff. he's he's on on uh the list for uh re coming back on the show this year i'm compiling a bunch of questions for him we're gonna do a q a kind of MythBuster kind of thingy Fuck yeah, dude! That'd be fucking dope. Yeah, because hey, he's a really, he's a really humble dude. Yeah, he's awesome, man. He's got so much knowledge; it's amazing. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, I keep talking, bringing up the school. It's like it's oh, kind of no, like it's, it's cool. the glass mecca around here. You know what I mean? No, it's good because like because you know ninety percent of our industry is non-educated in the sense of like going to a college or a school for glass blowing. And I get because I get asked all the time at work, you know, you go to school for this and. I tell people I'm self-taught for them for the most part, and they're blown away, no pun intended, by the whole situation, you know. And I'm like, it's just kind of trial by fire, yeah. you know. It's how it really kind of comes down to. But then having the fact that you can go to school and and then focus on a specific area is, it's even, you know, it's pretty badass. For sure, I mean, they have art program there too, you know. It's like, and mad respect, man, you know, teaching yourself and like coming up like that because that takes a lot of dedication and motivation to really dive into that. And nowadays, I feel like with technology and stuff, a lot of people, a lot of artists, directly into glass, I guess, um, don't really have that kind of drive. I feel like, you know, they'll watch these tutorial videos and then they'll just do it, do the same thing over and over and over. Which props for them, man. You gotta, there's gonna be trial and error with that, regardless. Mm-hmm. But it's like I feel like they don't. I feel like there's a lack of appreciation of like really sitting there and learning, learning it yourself and putting the time and and hours into it you know yeah for sure it's almost like it's almost like um this generation of glass blowers including myself you know um we're skipping a step it's like you know the trial and error step is kind of diminished it's like with all this technology you have all these awesome videos and tutorials which i think is great for the community it's going to help it grow quicker and hopefully get developed in a higher aspect i guess i could say mm-hmm. i don't really know how to word what i would, what i would say for that but basically i just want to see glass blowers put out some crazy fucking shit yeah you know and i feel like with all this tutorial shit it's gonna make it better yeah absolutely yeah but i, I understand what you're saying though because like i listen to a podcast called pokemon go radio these guys talk about the pokemon go show and stuff and they were talking today about you know the generation that and it's, i'm not even to like say the millennials it's just there's a generation right now that you know, if you're playing a video game and you're stuck on a level, you can just go on YouTube and watch somebody show you how to get through the level instead yeah, of like, exactly. you know, like I, I'm, I've spent fucking hours on trying to get past a certain level, like on Mario Brothers back in the day, you know, or whatever it was, you know, and I guess no, for sure. you know, all that shit just kind of grown up in my generation, you know, not the World War Two generation of all the those guys that were, you know supposedly the best generation of ever existed in this country you know, like, <laughs> or whatever but you know it's definitely uh i have had to learn the hard way but again now there's this all this open source and information not all of it's correct but 
it's still uh, yeah, yeah you know, for sure i think it's that, still knowledge being put out there yeah i still have an access i mean fuck my dryer took or my washer took a shit the other day and i'm like oh i'm gonna go on youtube and see what this says and you know i wasn't able to fix it but i got pretty close dude yeah my washer just fucked up right now the lock thing like doesn't work so it just sits there and beeps and you try to turn it off and it turns back on Oh my God, it's the uh, it's a nightmare. Yeah, it's annoying. My, I have a heat sensor issue right now, so it's like it'll go to a certain point and then it starts to give you hot water and then the beep 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 thing starts up and it, yeah, it's a pain. Oh, damn. Yeah, I looked up a YouTube video on it, but I couldn't find shit about it, so I like punched the thing. I'm like, God damn it, fucking work. <laughs> yeah, well, but, if you can figure it out, man, you should make a YouTube video for it. <laughs> I mean, it's working right now. Um, my girl like fucking just held down the button for like two minutes, the power button, and. It just turned off, and then when we used it, it was fine. The cool. lock worked again. It's like a magnetic sensor or sensor lock. It's real weird. Yeah, that's what mine has the same exact thing. You got to hold like the the pause button for a certain amount of time. Yeah, you know the technology. There's lots of ways to reset it. I mean, shit, man. I took this thing apart, and there was a manual inside of the washing machine, like in the back of the har- the housing, that is for the repair guy that has step by steps on all the ways of what you have to do to go through and buttons you hit and certain codes you can put in and stuff to figure out what the what the issue is so i just use that to my you know to my advantage nice yeah i was pretty pretty stoked but uh yeah enough about the washing machines yeah my bad fucking <laughs> no it's okay i kind of got me heated when you brought that up i was like damn my <laughs> fucking washer's fucked up too man shit yeah it sucks i'm not gonna go to the laundromat my girl actually went to her parents yesterday to use their washing machine real quick to do some shit because we have the airbnb and i'm like fuck we got people coming today and i've got no clean towels for them and oh damn so how is that like uh you know having an art our airbnb i'm digging it man it's uh not only is it helping offset the cost of my rent for the house that i'm in but uh it's giving me a chance to get to meet people like not everybody is social but the people that i've met that are social are it's been it's been cool man i got people coming from all over the world i mean literally coming from all over the world to stay here and being close to the theme parks um, it's, you know, it's affordable for them. And that's kind of how I set it up too, was I wanted to make it an affordable place. That's super comfy, kind of five star experience that they can come in and, and feel at home after the craziness of being in the theme parks or just dealing with Orlando in general. Cause it's a, it's a fucking high energy clusterfuck of a place here. Yeah. Fuck yeah. <clears throat> so I've been to Disney in so long. Yeah. It's come down, man. Anytime. Yeah. I definitely, I plan on coming down for the gas conference. Yeah. Which is in Tampa, I think. It's in it's St. Pete. Yeah, it's actually my my St. old Pete, hometown. Right. Yeah, man, that's, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, kind of I was gonna do a year in review episode about 2018, as especially like I was thinking about the gas conference going to Italy this this year, and how cool that you know conceptually wise that is to kind of go back to the mecca of glass and um, I guess it's been probably 15 years now maybe I'm not really sure what year it was but we had the Chihuly collection come in town he did like this Chihuly across Florida series and had like I think it was six museums he had simultaneous shows going on oh damn and uh yeah it was pretty neat seeing it and I didn't go to all of them but I went to the one in St. Pete and the St. Pete one that we had is at this old ass museum and it was the the biggest most visited show they had ever had ever in the history of this museum and it's been it's a hundred year old museum and so they extended the show a couple months longer and then uh, Chihuly himself fell in love with the area, and with the weather we have, and the this just the settings. I always kind of felt like after that whole Chihuly thing, like it was going to be like the next mecca for glass. And then about five years after his museum show, we had the Chihuly collection actually come in as his first permanent installation collection, which I had the opportunity to to work at and uh, be a part of that situation for a couple of years. Oh, fuck yeah. That's you know, dope. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. Yeah. And that was actually my first really experience and in, in, uh, exposure to the hot shop. Like, I was doing full tours on, you know, with guests and teaching the, and stuff, uh, our docents on, on Chihuly himself and about the glass. But my knowledge for the hot shop was very only, really only from just basic, like you're saying, YouTube or seeing some Chihuly videos that I've seen. So we had a hot shop that opened up. So I got a chance to really go watch and I would take guests on vip tours to this thing so i really got a chance to be exposed to it um but now we have all these new glass blowers and studios opening up all over st pete and now we have the fucking gas conference coming which is huge and it's it's uh it's really seems like it's like you know you have got venice and murano and seattle and now we've got good old st pete as a place for hell yeah damn fuck it we need something in the northeast now yeah i'm sure you know, well, we got Corning, Corning, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and see, that was another thing I want to bring up, too. Did you see that freaking uh, the glass barge thing that they did this year? Oh, yeah, that shit was fucking cool. 
Yeah, so those that don't know about it, I'm actually going to bring it up real quick here. There was a guy um, that came and he did a demo at our um, in my hot shop class. He was like a visiting artist, and he was he worked on that. I'm pretty sure. I need to fucking. You're talking about the glass bars, they're like they're on the water, blowing oh, glass yeah. and shit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck, who the fuck was that? I can't. I can't remember his name. So I'm sorry. My bad. Oh yeah, no, you're bad. good, dude. I'm actually gonna read. This comes off of uh, cmog.org, which is the Corning Museum of Glass.org. So the glass barge was basically a celebration for their the the basically for Corning, who has been huge and changing the world of glass. I mean, literally. Yeah, you know, for sure. Everything from TVs to cell phones. I mean, you fucking you name it. All of our cookware. Um, yeah, so basically it says, uh, it says uh, glass making innovations in Corning have shaped the modern world from the first electric light bulb for Thomas Edison and the invention of optical fiber for telecommunications the, to the glass used in modern flat screen displays. And that story all began with a voyage on New York's waterways. In 1868, the Brooklyn Flint Glass Company relocated to Corning via the New York waterways and evolved into the company that is now known today as Corning Incorporated. It celebrated its 150th anniversary uh, of this pivotal journey, uh, CMOG launched Glass Barge, a 30-foot by 80-foot canal barge equipped with Corning Museum of Glass's patented all-electric glassmaking equipment in Brooklyn R uh, Bridge Park on May 17, 2018. It then traveled north on the Hudson, then westward along the Erie Canal uh, before it made its way to the Finger Lakes. It stopped at Ports and Yonkers and a bunch of other places it names. Uh, ceremonial last leg of the trip took place on land and concluded in Corning with a community-wide celebration, Harvest Homecoming, on September 22nd. So basically they designed and built this barge that had a hot shop on it, it had demonstrations, and it had seats in like a bleacher style where you can go float down the river and watch glass blowing demonstrations, which Fuck is yeah, I th fucking cool I as think shit. That shit yeah, that shit is fucking awesome. Oh, we got the uh, the hot rod garbage trucks driving bike. Nice. I was wondering what that I was like, wait, was that me? Yes. Was that <laughs> Yeah. Shit. They um yeah, the Corning also does that thing where um you can uh, it's like a job offering, I guess, where you work on it, I think it's with the Disney cruise, right? Uh it's it used to be with celebrity and they they've actually stopped. Oh, they stopped doing that. Yeah, as of last year, from what I understand. Cause, Damn. And oh. I and I don't I th I don't know why exactly. I had Eric Goldschmidt on, and we were talking about that. Um, because I was curious if they could sell their stuff. You know, when they would make. I mean, just the fact of being a, a hot shop worker on top of a cruise ship. Like he was like, yeah, man. There were times where we were like, w you know, this, the boat swaying because you're on the very top of the ship, <laughs> you know. Oh <laughs> so damn! Imagine being at like the bottom of a pendulum, you know, in a sense, working in a hot shop. So yeah, he that said sounds it was, like a learning curve right there. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> it, but Corning's being a nonprofit, um, they couldn't sell their stuff necessarily. So I I, I, I don't that. I don't know if that was part of it because the guests want to buy their shit and they couldn't. I, yeah, I don't, I'm just you know throwing things out there, so I'm not really sure. But there's another. If I understand, there's another studio now that uh, has contracts with them. Oh, that's cool though. Yeah, because I think that's a great idea too. Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, I've actually was talking to my owners of my company about that because um, we're trying to incorporate ourselves into the cruise ship industry ourselves. So it's like untapped with Disney. Like, I mean, it's it's ten thousand dollars for a family of four to go on a week long cruise now on these cruise ships at Disney. Damn, it's a lot more money than I could spend. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, it's and it's all inclusive. So don't get me wrong. I mean, the value is there, but still. Oh yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. I'm going to use my discount if I can. <laughs> Hell yeah, I would. That's awesome that you work at Disney, though, like blowing glass there. I think that's super fucking cool. Yeah, man, it's a, it's a childhood and adult dream come true for me, you know, being in the situation and, and getting to share and expose the world literally to what we do, you know, in terms of the glass, whether it's in the hot shop or on the torch. It's uh, I love talking with the guests. Like, you know, it gets to the end of the night and I'm tired and I don't necessarily want to, but I still do. <clears throat> but uh yeah it's it's uh, it's it's definitely interesting and we have our company rebus brothers has a 50 year history with disney and so we you know being a part of this lineage of glass blowers that have been with the company for 50 years going back to the days of disneyland and walt meeting the original brothers at the world's fair in 1964 i mean there's like and, I, and i'm a huge disney nerd and i have a huge respect and appreciation for walt disney himself and what he did as an innovator um you know so it's just it's 
it's it's it's really cool, man. It's 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 an interesting opportunity for sure. You know, I, oh, I've, yeah. I've had to learn how to play by the rules in a in a sense. And uh, hey, I mean, you're yeah. hopping in the hot shop. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's another cool fucking thing. Yeah, yeah, and I, I would, mean, yeah, I, I don't think I've. Have you worked in the hot shop before? No, Disney? no. Before before that, I did. I had did a uh, over. I was living in this little city called Gulfport, which is just outside of St. Pete, and. Uh, we had the industrial arts center there that I used to assist in the hot shop there during classes. I actually taught lamp working classes and I would get hot shop time for my time for the teaching that I did. So, oh, yeah. so I would assist. Fair trade off. Yeah, it was nice, man. So we would do like, you know, make a heart couple night or make pumpkins and ornaments, and whatever. So I would assist with that kind of stuff. And then I got to a point to where on off times I would, I would assist with the artists that were doing their own thing. And then, uh, they would give me a chance to then go and do my own thing with them. So I've got a couple of different items that I had made. And then it was probably about five, six years. Well, no, actually probably longer than that. No, I'd say about five, five years until I actually finally got a chance to get my first gather by myself. Cause like I, they would get a gather for me. Yeah, nice. So yeah. Yeah. I that, fucking love the hot shop. Yeah, man. I, I, I'm, I got transferred out of there over to where I'm at now, like right before summertime started. So it was like a blessing in disguise, but I definitely go in there every once in a blue moon when I cover a shift to get my fix. Cause like, I, it's like something I got to get it. I got to have my fix. Did I feel you? Like when I finished school this semester, <clears throat> I was talking to my advisor. I was like, look, I want to come back, but I don't want to pay for school obviously, but I just want to take hot shop classes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So luckily enough, my teacher was like, yeah, you can TA my class next semester. And I was like, cool. So I get to just have a free blow slot, you know, after class and work for free for three hours. Yeah, that's awesome. And then also so, assisting, yeah. man. It's, it's it's amazing how much you can learn assisting and teaching. Oh, dude. Yeah, seriously. And my teacher's awesome. She's really hands on, explains things really well. So grateful for that. Yeah, it's and awesome. Assisting, or, uh, assisting, I feel like that's the that's how you're going to learn. You know what I mean? Just assisting the gaffer. Just watch. You have to watch him no matter what or her. Yep. You know, you have to keep your eyes in their eyes at all time. Yep. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I just love I, – I can never get over the fact about, like, you know, you know, I'm passionate about it. Like, I just love making art with my friends. And when you're in the hot shop and you're all just collectively on this one piece – I fucking love it. <laughs> I just do. It's great. Yeah, it's cool, man. I, I've always like looked at it as like a band. Literally, yeah. it literally is. You know, just making some pretty oh, music. Cool. Yeah, for sure. So, like, do you have any like dreams and aspirations for yourself in terms of like big projects or anything that you'd want to create and making with the glass with all this knowledge that you've been uh, consuming? I mean, dude, I just want to like make friends in the glass world, you know, and collab with people doesn't matter skill level or whatever and uh i don't know i don't not really dude i just want to blow glass that's it's all that keeps me sane to so, be honest so do you find like you do the glass just because you love the glass or do you do it for the art or is it a, kind of a little bit of both a little bit of both i mean when i first got in i, I mean obviously i first got into it i was mind blown i was just mind blown by it. i was taken back but um i don't know i just like blown I don't know. I would say like I I like the artistic aspect of it more than scientific aspect of it. Mm-hmm. I should say so. Yeah, I just I I when I hop on the torch sometimes I don't even know what I'm gonna make. I just start melting shit and then pieces pieces start coming together. It's not like I have a set drawing or a set production line that I need to work on or want to work on. Yeah, it's kind of whatever comes to you. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. I I'm, I don't know. My bad. That's probably a horrible fucking answer right there. But. Oh no, dude. Because honestly, I've always I've always been intrigued by that. Because for me, I'm very technical. Like I'm like I have like an architect engineering brain. So like I draw paper first, create you know a little bit of a blueprint per se of what I'm going to make and break things down into sections and segments and like this is going to be this and that and blah 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 and then I go make a piece and clear just to kind of run through what I'm going to do and then I go into the project. And I've always been intrigued by artists like you said pre-show like you know you, you suck at drawing so like those that really don't even draw these go right from their head to glass I've, it's for me it's it's hard to comprehend but i have a i have a respect and admiration for those that can do that that can just go just i, like, I need a starting point i need you know i have I feel you. so much inspiration but it's too much you know there's like, there's something like sometimes if i'm doing a collab with a friend and we like 
we're like getting real in depth with it and we're like oh let's do this but let's do this let's do this and i'm like all right maybe we should draw this out <laughs> yeah you know what i mean yeah. so, so in some cases i'll you know i'll draw things out but m- more than more cases so i just i just go for it hell yeah and not scientific wrong with that. though dude scientific you gotta fucking draw you have to have a blueprint sketch measurements everything it's yeah. it's literally a whole like it's a whole new ballpark <laughs> well i know guys like nicholson for instance he, he, like he actually draws it to scale like on a graph paper you know parts oh, and components you know if he's going to make one of his weapons of you know whatever he's doing oh uh, yeah that shit's know. so intricate man like yeah when, it, when you get in depth like that you totally you, i mean you would totally have to have a have a spec spec you can you couldn't just wing that you know mm-hmm. i mean i'm sure you could but at his caliber why why do that when i don't know yeah yeah i think that's why it's important to have like a whiteboard or a chalkboard in your shop you know because like you know oh, like in, sure. in a hot shop i'd sure. love to draw on the floor like what i'm gonna what we're gonna work on you know kind of get an <laughs> idea it's fucking cool you it know it definitely is yeah and i like i over at at Disney, we we never did that, but they've just recently put up a big chalkboard so that they can actually kind of sketch out what's going to be made, so the guests can kind of see, you know, also what's going to be made too. But uh, you know, I should, I should probably get in the habit of doing that more, to be honest. Yeah, I think it's a good it's it's a good thing to do, you know. But yeah. at the same time, like free flow and fucking have fun, you know. It's like why not? Yeah, but I mean, you know, I guess in a sense of I don't want to be a scientific worker the rest of my life, so. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe trying to trying to dial in on a lot of, you know, like I said earlier, you know, it's try to focus on the finer things with everything you make. You know, every step counts. So every every perfect prep makes perfect work. You know, yeah. so so true. Yeah, maybe maybe this this little conversation right here that's gonna put me. I'm gonna get that whiteboard set up in the fucking shop. Do it. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that tomorrow. Let's yeah. Hell yeah, because like I'm start I, drawing shit up. You know, it's you know, like I was saying. For me, I need I need parameters, and I've had guests come up to me and I order something custom, and they're like, "Oh, I'll let the artist have fun." I'm like, "I'll have fun, but I need like I need specifics. Like, what colors do you want? How big? How much you oh, paint? Yeah, you know what I mean? Sure. Like, it's otherwise, especially when it when it comes down to a custom, that's like a that's another ballpark right there. Mm-hmm. I I don't do customs, man. Like, on my I sell my work through Instagram and. I, I, I tell people they hit me up. They're like, "Oh, dude, I want a custom with like, I want it to look like this and like this." this. I'm like, "Dude, I'm sorry. I would love to take that on, but I just I can't." You know what I mean? Me personally, I, and it's nothing against them or anything. It's just when I do a custom, I feel like I'm not. I don't put out the quality I can actually put out because I'm so stressed out about about making it perfect for them and then like trying to make it perfect for myself. And it's just I don't know. I've had some bad bad custom projects but no I, same with me and that's why I, I really like i have two right now that i'm wrapping up that have been honestly in, in the making for about two years now and they've been awesome patient wise because i understood my situation and having to move and whatever but yeah that's good, like yeah. once they're done like you know i'm good because uh i'm gonna i have you know i have a couple lines like 2019 i'm gonna reintroduce the pipe into my life but i have i have a, a project i'm working on that's gonna be a, a series of work that's gonna be more of like yeah. a, a body of work in a sense so i can Fuck start yeah. you know focus on doing some shows eventually down the road dude that'd be stellar you should totally do that yeah, yeah. I, what i really want to do honestly long term with the show is to have shows for this podcast and bring the guests that i've had for that year and do like an end of the year show of their glass you know what I mean? Nice. And like see pro- see like progression of that year or No, no, no. Like every guest I've had on, like say every guest I have on for 2019, I'll have a host a show centrally in somewhere in the country that uh oh, I- nice. ideally like all my guests can meet up at and bring their work and have like a big show of like hey, this is this is what they do here they are in person. You know, kind That'd of That'd be really cool. And the, the be a good way for like everybody to kind of meet, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Who's been a part of your show? That's yeah, I think that's great. That would be good for the community, I feel like. Yeah, it'd be fun. Something you know? different. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's another thing I feel like the pipe scene needs is something different. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's yeah, it's so weird, man, because there's like so many things being offered right now, like classes and stuff that are being offered, you know, and it seems almost like, I hate to say it, but it seems like, and my brother and I were talking about this, it's, it's kind of like a fraternity kind of thing where you're paying to make friends or get to know a certain glass artist more yeah. so and take some dabs with them more so than actually go there to take in the knowledge that you're going in there for that they're going to actually show you 
You know, no, for sure. You know what I mean? And, and, and these classes are fucking expensive. I mean, it's expensive. You're paying a couple grand for like a weekend long class. And don't get me wrong, you're getting some serious exposure if you take advantage of it. You know, like if I go to a class, I'm not going to go there to, to make friends with anybody that's there. I'm going, except for the artists potentially. I'm going there to get my money's worth out of what I'm, you know, going there for. Dude, I wish I had the money to take an outsourced class like that. Like, I never, I've never, I've always wanted to, never had the money to, you know. The mm-hmm. only class teaching I've gotten is from Salem Community College, you know, and that's just scientific shit and hot shop. I took a bead making class too, but that was it. But yeah, man, and, you got a ton of knowledge though from it. Oh yeah, man. Oh, Which for sure. Cool. And dude, ninety percent of the kids that come there make pipes from all over the country. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got friends now all over the country, which is awesome. They're all great. You know, everybody's great people there. It's good times. There's there's like four studios walking distance from my house right now. You know what I mean? Wild. And yeah, I mean, just like I guarantee, some of them are there right now, just blowing glass and. It's a mecca down here. It's really cool. Yeah, it's good to know because I've actually had guests from that area that we talked. They talked about Wheaton and stuff, you know, and the, and asked if I know about that. And uh, they're like, "Well, yeah, but are there, are there any other hot shops or studios up there?" And I'm like, "I think there is." You know, go on Google and look. But yeah, it's good to hear that. There yeah, I is. mean, you have the you have the college, obviously, if you're a student. But then you have Asbury Park up uh, in Asbury Park. It's Hot Sand Studios, I think okay. it's called. And then over in Philly, which is like, it's probably about 50 or 45 minute drive from where I'm at. Um, it's called, uh, fuck, it's in Maniunk. Um, it's like the borough of Philly, Maniunk. Um, what is it called? East Falls. That's what it is. Okay. Yeah, East Falls Glass. That's another one. Yeah, there's a few like right around here. I'm trying to think if there's another one. I don't think so. Not that I know. Well, but, it, you know, like I was saying pre-show, it makes sense that 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 area is kind of turning into that because of the old industrial sense yeah. of what it used to be there. And I'm sure there's plenty of buildings that are, you know, not being used and utilized, so they're putting studios and stuff in it. Oh yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a vacant glass building in uh, Salem City, right down the street, right down the street here. Huh. It's been vacant for a long time, and they used to do shit like how Wheaton did back in the day, you know. You know, making milk bottles and fucking all that kind of shit. Yeah, it's 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 what I find interesting too is how like the central of our country, like the Ohio Valley, that whole area, you know, in a sense, was like a huge glass center in the world. It was here in this country and back in the industrial days, you know, all these huge. I mean, everybody from Blanco to you name it, you know, just they were houseware stuff, but they were the major manufacturers of glass in this country that oh, yeah. were all in like the central of the country. It's just fascinating. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. I don't really know much about the history of it, to be honest. Um, yeah, me neither. I just I just know but, of it, in a sense. Yeah, and that's good. I should probably... <laughs> they teach you that at the school, but if you're in art classes, but... Yeah, you miss those days? I, I, <laughs> I failed that class, to be honest. Right even now. better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I even asked... When I graduated here, I asked my advisor, I was like, look... Uh, how much do I need to get my art degree? And she like named a list of classes. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not taking like art history. I'm not taking this, you know, I'd have to basically a a class on just glass and writing papers. And I'm like, I'm not blowing glass in that class. Nope. Okay. I don't want to take it. So just hot shop. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. You know, I I have friends of mine that had like art history degrees and I couldn't, I do like, I have trouble remembering names and much less like, artist names that are Italian or something like that, you know, that you can't really pronounce. I feel that. You know, and they're like, they can see a painting and like, oh yeah, this is so-and-so and and this is when it was the time period and this is what they used and it's all fascinating stuff to me, but just it's just it's so dry i can't i can't even fucking fathom reading books yeah my my brain moves too quick for that shit you know what i mean yeah yeah 100 percent. i give them props totally give them props for that you know what i mean but yep i sure do yeah our history is (laughs) not for me (laughs) no man but it would be pretty cool though like i which i've something i've thought about like trying to figure out i know that people have talked about like the family tree of the pipe industry but just like it'd be fun to kind of do a a modern kind of glass history of this country, you know, within like the, the 20th century kind of stuff. Yeah, no, for sure. So see where it's evolved. Cause it's constantly evolving, which again is why being a one trick pony does nobody any good when you're a glass maker. Yeah, it definitely doesn't. And that's, that's why I like, 
not just making pipes. I like being in the hot shop, you know, doing scientific. But I wish I had dwelled, dwell, would dwell into like sculpting on the torch more. But I don't know. I just uh, every time I tell myself I will, and I do on occasion. I have made some like sculptural rigs and stuff, but I try to do these like gremlin demonic things, but. I don't know. I like it, hype hype myself up one week, and I'm like, I'm fucking gonna make one today. And then I put 14 hours in on this piece, and then, you know, I make it, and then four months go by, and I don't make another one. You know. Mm-hmm. But, well, at least you get out of your system in a sense. Yeah, no, for sure, and it feels good when I do it. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Yeah, man. But that's an, that's yeah. another thing. Like we're talking about the outsourced classes, like all these top eight guys. I would love to take a sculptural class and like just to learn something. I feel like it would give me a little more drive within myself to really really dwell into it you know what i mean yeah the, i think the for me personally like the, the two classes i took the best thing i got out of them was the ability to see tools that were being used and how they were used <clears throat> you know because you kind of have an idea on certain things but then when you see someone like do there's i don't know what the hell the tool is called but it's like a a ball on the end of a stick that you can use like you can push it into a piece of tubing to push out like a shoulder or a cheekbone or something like that you know i know exactly what you're talking about i forget the name of that tool yeah i, yeah, I don't remember what it is but i remember seeing steve size love use it one time and i was like man that is so smart i never even thought about that so. yeah martin uh what's this i don't know how to pronounce the last name i'm totally gonna butcher it but martin janecki sounds right uh yeah the hot shop sculptor he does he uses those a lot and he does the inside out sculpting in the hot shop he makes those like realistic looking faces and yeah. skulls and all kinds of shit. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and I think like 2018 for me was like ex- being exposed to the hot shop made me start researching ex- the hot shop stuff and just seeing the amount of amazing, talented stuff artist wise and shit being created in the hot shop that we couldn't imagine was going to be made five years ago. That's being made to that nowadays. You know, it's just, it's so fucking crazy how, just the technical sculptural side of things are getting to, you know, oh, yeah. just even, even in the pipe scene, do you know what I oh, mean? Oh yeah, for sure. Like, like, I guess for me in the hot shop though, it's a little different because of how soft that glass is and the ability to push something around. And when you do something else is moving with it, you know what I mean? For sure. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I don't know. I've never tried sculpting in the hot shop. I'm still, I'm still trying to gather my, you know, my skill set in the hot shop, but like shaping wise and trying to get a consistent wall weight, not too thick, but a good sculptor in the hot shop you should look up is uh, Grant Garmezzi. He's really fucking good. He does like a lot of animals and shit. Okay, I'll write that down. Yeah, Grant Garmezzi's cool. He's uh, he's pretty close to here too. Um, I think he's in Merrill, no, Virginia, I think. He's got like a home hot shop studio. Follow him on Instagram. He he has some funny stories too, like on his Insta stories. Hell yeah. Yeah, there's somebody else I was actually trying to find. Uh, what the fuck is his name? Uh, hot shop sculptor? Yeah, fucking uh, Raven. I can look at You said Raven? Yeah, I. I, I is a uh is this it right here yeah um raven's sky river studios yes thank you yeah it's um damn that's a badass looking shit dude what that fucking turtle Uh, that's what i'm saying (laughs) god damn dude oh that was and it says wise one 2014 yeah if you get a chance four years ago watch that video bro it is fucking incredible Oh my god! Yeah, like he has like the head of the turtle he makes, and it looks like super realistic. And then That's he has like another thing I wish we had in the in Boro. I feel like Hot Shop has a lot more variety of like color. Oh yeah, you know what I mean. But man, you know what? Like for me, that was my biggest learning curve was understanding what colors to use with each other because not everything works well together and dealing with certain metals and like there's so much nuance and science and the science and alchemy in a hot shop that it's sure it's in the boro but like it is so important to understand that shit when you're in the hot shop absolutely no and i don't know anything about batching dude there's um there's a color theory school or a color theory class actually at the school that they have where they 
they learn how to batch color, uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it is. But yeah, like understanding, you know, certain like adventuring. Like I would use a lot with or you know using it like with cobalt or white even, and understanding oh, that looks really good with white. Oh yeah, it looks gnarly. But like, and then going in, but understanding like how to get your gather, get a bubble, get white, get the adventuring, go into an optic mold, and then the glory hole, and then blow it out in an ornament without burning the adventuring out. And it's like, it, oh shit, yeah. you know what I mean? Like the steps and timing. So like, I learned how to really, really how to work the glass cold, so compared to working it hot because I wasn't overheating the stuff. Yeah, it's more like work it quick too. Yeah, that's at that point. Yeah, you gotta almost do that in like one heat. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were exactly. I would get a gather, get my color, fucking quick, quick heat, optic mold that shit, and then blow it out. And like right there on the bench, I wouldn't even sit down. I would just angle it on the bench and just fucking blow it out, cap it. Nice, nice. And then blow it out. And the fun thing with the with our hot shop because it's a solo show, so we use blow hoses for everything. So having the already had the knowledge for my using a blow hose and the studio on the torch. It just carried right over into the hot shop, you know, even more so. Nice. I haven't used a blow hose yet in the hot shop. I, I'm, I'm grateful to say that my friend assists me whenever I need them for my blow slots, so that's definitely cool. Yeah, but if you get a chance, man, tr- like try to make a solo ornament one day. Yeah, I should do that. I definitely should. No, well, next semester, man, I'm probably gonna, I'm gonna be poaching blow slots every Saturday when cool. I can. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna end up getting, getting a blow hose for that. Hell yeah! What kind of uh, clear were you guys using in the in the hot shop? Do you know? I forget what the fuck it was. Um, we were talking about that that one day, and yeah. I I had texted it to you. I don't remember because I was asking you if you use spruce pine because I know that's like a really that's like a, a really prominently used uh, glass in the hot shop. Um, fuck, what is it called? I think it started with a C. Yeah, uh, I'm looking at it. it's uh, Cristalica. I think it's. Yes, yes, I th- I'm pretty sure that's what we use. Yeah, we used we used spruce pine for a long time, and then uh, s- we started getting a lot of cords in the tank. And for a those that don't cords, I don't know if you know what that is. So, like, if if you don't, if you when you're when you're charging a furnace, if you charge it, if you don't allow the, the tank to drop down to a certain level, <clears throat> all that glass in the very bottom of the tank it gets old after a while, in a sense. And, right. and the glass actually creates like what we call cords and it's like strands of glass that are actually kind of, it's like a, if you looked at like, say like a, this looks like spaghetti in there in a sense, but it's, a, but it's, oh, it's clear and you can't really see it until you go in for a gather. And then when you go to blow out your piece, you can literally see like the cord like wrapped around the, the body of the piece that you're working on. It's really strange. Uh-huh. So the glass is, it's almost like a, it constricts the glass so you can't blow it out consistent. And, oh, damn. Uh, and part of our problem was just, was we were just kind of we were charging the furnace way too often, you know, not really getting into the bottom and getting that shit out. Because even though like as the glass, because like all of our furnaces that we use at Disney are all electric, and uh, okay, so yeah. you know, the 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 glass it it tends to stir itself as you're going in there and getting your gathers, but it doesn't always. So like the very bottom of your pot again, it's just going to kind of get a little shitty. And if you go too deep, then you really start to get those cord- the cords actually will get brought up and mixed into the rest of your batch i was gonna say if you before you charged it what if you like rake the bottom would that like help out or i don't we you know we didn't really, it and then charged it we didn't really have the tool necessarily like we had it like a hoe <laughs> i mean literally okay in true, the garden yeah. you know what i mean that we that we yeah, could yeah, use yeah. that uh a couple times like an element would break and fall into the pot and you know we had to go in there and scoop it out real quick and then change out the element before the fucking thing would crash on us <clears throat> which is always scary as shit but uh yeah it was just yeah th- those were those were like the little small things you know when you talk about the color and the little nuances in the hot shop that you'll never have to experience and deal with in and boro of any type you know even though boro has its own little nuances but still it's the hot shop environment it's again if you get a chance to go and take a class and or even just do a tandem glass blowing experience with somebody it's it's amazing how much shit you're gonna learn just just from doing it dude even just watching them do it yeah exactly you know what i mean like holy shit yeah i think the the watching aspect is important because you can get a chance to really watch hands and movement and rotation and balance and just how fucking crazy the hot shop environment really is yo for real yeah 
And like, I don't know, man. I really, I really do believe. Like, if you're, if you haven't been in the hot shop, but you've been in pipe maker or flame worker, whatever, do it because you're gonna, dude, you're gonna get, you're gonna gain experience onto your torch just by working in the hot shop. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. I, th- I really do believe it transfers over uh, skill set. Yeah, and, and what I think is fascinating too is like for me, the hot shop taught me a lot about balance and control. You know, yep. and, and when you're like trying to carry a gather, you know, or a three gather piece across the hot shop without losing it for one, but keeping it balanced and centered at the same time without losing like a pattern or a shape or whatever, you know, and your blowpipe weighs five pounds, you know, it's, it's hard to really feel how heavy your glass is. Like when you're making an ornament on a three pound blowpipe, your ornament may weigh a half a pound, but it feels like it was way heavier than what it is until you get yeah, the thing off the blowpipe. it feels like you have a fucking you know, 20 pound thing or 10 pound, 15 pound thing in your hand. Yeah. It's, it's so weird. But you know, then I started learning about like the, how important the moil is and having glass on the moil and getting the glass off the moil. And you know, like, and the moil is the end of the blowpipe for those that don't know, when you go to get a gather, the blowpipe looks like a kind of like a Q-tip where it's a little fatter at the end of the blowpipe. And that's where you gather your glass onto it. And the idea is to have just enough glass on the moil because that's what keeps your glass stuck to the pipe. But if you have too much on there, then you can have cracking issues because that's cooling off. Or if you have not enough, then you don't have enough glue, quote unquote, to keep the glass down the blowpipe. You know, so that was a big problem of mine uh, when I was first in the hot shop was not flashing my moil or mm. my ponies enough. I learned very quickly, though, <laughs> to flash them, you know. Do you guys have a pipe warmer? Uh, we have a pipe warmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, but like I'm when saying, you're actually like, when you're working the piece. Yeah, when you're working the piece, you yeah. know, because I, you know, I was not really in, you know, I'm new. I was I'm still new to the hot shop, you know. So it's like, I definitely learned though, like flashing your moil and your punny while you're working the, a piece is like essential. That's why I love the fucking bushy torch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those big propane guys are awesome. Hell yeah! But then also using those things to reduce color and like play with that kind of stuff too. And you you know dealing with chemical chemical composition and chemistry and glass so yeah man so it's it's just cool because you know the flame chemistry is so important when you're dealing with boro and boro colors and if to be able to learn that kind of stuff too in the hot shop it's you know again it's it all just kind of crossover type knowledge that you'll take into the studio no matter what kind of glass you're playing with oh yeah for sure i'm still um like we have a foot pedal on our on one of our glory holes to reduce colors interesting like yeah it's actually really cool um it looks really cool too when you hold when you like hold the foot pedal down like fire is just like spewing out of the glory hole. but um yeah it's cool i don't really i still haven't learned a lot of the colors in the hot shop so i don't know which ones are reducing which ones do whatever you know what I mean? mm-hmm. what does what but uh some of my friends are like yo that's like a you know striking color it reduces like you should reduce it and i'm like uh okay so i'll just sit there with the foot pedal for a little bit you know reduce it out and then cool it down do my gather if like if i'm doing an overlay or something you know um yeah yeah so does it does the foot pedal bring oxygen into the into the glory hole i think it brings more it like it almost it looks like it cools down oh okay the glory hole, like it's putting gas it's putting gas into it or or fire i guess i should say like a like there's an extra like a bushy torch is being hit into there interesting I think it cools it down, dude. I don't even know. I'd have to. I'll find out eventually, and I'll text it to you. Yeah, let, let me know. know. Um, yeah, I'm yeah, curious. Yeah, definitely will. Because I've never seen the, that. There's a the guy that um he's like one of the directors there at the school. He he's built most of the equipment in the hot shop, so like the glory holes, the furnace, and everything. Nice, glory yeah, hole so is one of those terms I can't use at Disney. I we have to call it a reheater. A reheater? Yeah. Oh, it's too sexual. Yeah. <laughs> it can be little kids like mommy what's a glory hole yeah exactly well you know it's funny like i, I would it's when i was doing my de- my demos and talking about getting you know trapping air into the glass and then allowing it to inflate all by itself you know i was like the glass almost blows itself i said a couple times and i'm thinking to myself like yeah i gotta change how i say that it just sounds ridiculous <laughs> there's just so many sexual innuendos in glass i love it oh i know it's amazing <laughs> It's but, great. <laughs> you know, it reminds me like, you know, like Figment that I'm making, his body is is such a cock and balls look to it when I'm making them. Like, it's like so phallic. When I was first doing it, I was like, I just would feel uncomfortable on making this thing, you know. So I got, I'm not now making a routine when I go work at my warehouse every two weeks. I just make a ton of bodies ahead of time so I can just bring them into the shop and heat them up and, and then finish them. 
just nice. to, you know I just crank out a bunch of dicks at, at the warehouse and bring, bring them into work. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh, dude, it's the worst. Like, there's a couple pieces that I do. Like, I actually had a girl one day ask me if I was making a penis, and there, there was nobody in our store, so I was like, "Yeah, actually, I am." I, I wasn't sure what else to say to her. <laughs> it kind of caught me off guard. <laughs> what's the uh, What's the character? Uh, Figment is the one that I'm doing right now. He's a dragon. So like the, oh, cool. the dragon body, you know, just kind of the way the shape of it is, because he has a fat butt but his butt kind of slumps back to where his tail is connected and then you have like and he stands up on his back hind legs too so he's not like a four you know four-legged dragon but like disney's patenting dildos now oh dude they're known for putting dicks and all kind of stuff like my buddy (laughs) my buddy chad he has a company a little boutique side kind of inspired company called hundred acre hood and uh we're we he just moved out here from california and uh, disney's known for all their hidden mickeys everywhere and it's just a fun thing that the the artists do. They hide little Mickey icons or just, you know, there's like, you can line up like four or five rock structures in a row and it makes like Mickey at the helm and Steamboat Willie. Like it's just fucking amazing how these guys have That's this pretty cool. foresight. But uh, we met up with Chad over in Epcot one day in the, in the land. And for those that know the land, um, they used to have a show there that was the Circle of Life. And it was like uh, Timon and Pumbaa from The Lion King and Simba talking about the circle of cycle of life in Africa and the animals and whatever. And when you're sitting in the waiting room, the queue um, to wait for the next show, the inside of the walls has like this, it's kind of like a carpeted mural and it's the cycle of life. Everything from like the flowering, whatever, to the pollination, to the actual plant itself. And I, we go up there and I see Chad and, and we, you know, we hug it out and whatever. And like, Hey, nice to meet you. And he's like, I'm like, so what are you doing up here? He's like, Oh, I'm just checking out the hidden dickies. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? He's like, come check it out. And the show's closed now, but you can still see inside the queue. And I shit you not, I'll never be able to see it again, but it's literally dicks and vaginas and fallopian tubes is what you it looks like on, now that I'm an adult looking at this shit. So we take like a selfie in front of the wall, and it's like these big fucking dicks on the wall behind us. You know, <laughs> It is impossible to not. I'm, I'll put a picture up on the uh, show notes, a little link to it for everybody to see. But it's it's so funny now. So now we're like going around looking for hidden dicks in Disney. <laughs> yeah, I definitely want to see that. That's yeah. funny. Oh, my God. I'll see if I'll, I'll text it to you now before I forget. But, uh, <laughs> oh, man, it's, it's so fucking good. Shit just cracks me up all the time. But, uh. I'm going to uh, actually make a note because I'll have to go through my pictures and that might take forever to fucking. Yeah, yeah, you don't, you don't got to send it to me right now. Yeah, well, I'm just making a note because I won't forget. So, uh, yeah, dude, so that being said, I think it'd be a good place for us to take a break here. I'm talking about dicks and stuff. And, uh... Yeah, right? All right, yeah. <laughs> no, dilly dilly. And uh, thanks some sponsors for helping out with this show. And then uh, we'll be back and it'll be time for us to crash the kiln. Fuck yeah. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Since its inception, the focus of The Flow has been to provide a bond among members of the lamp working community. At every issue, you can enjoy great content with the hottest artists and cutting edge techniques using the latest industry products. These features, along with the continuation of our Women in Glass edition, Glass Craft Emergent Artist Awards, inspiring gallery showcases, dynamic general interest articles, as well as health and safety information, make The Flow the leading international lamp working journal. For more information or to subscribe to The Flow, go to theflowmagazine.com that's theflowmagazine.com all right man we are back so uh the crash of the killing round consists of seven questions you can give me a 30 to 60 second answer and expound upon them as we typically do here and uh, the first question I always like to ask, which is always a tough one, is if there's any living glass artists that you want to work with and collab with and have not yet done it, uh, who is it and why? Essentially, man, anyone. Honestly, I don't, I don't know. I, I look to a lot of glass artists. Like I look up to them, and they inspire me to, you know, be a better glass artist. I just love collabing. I love making art with my friends. Anyone. You know? Yeah. You want to? You're in the fucking. You're near Jersey, dude. Hit me up. Let's blow some glass. Let's, let's make some art. I don't care if you sell it or not, and keep it. Let's blow glass. Do you have any like favorite particular artists that you like look up to or are inspired by their work? Yeah, for sure. Brandon Martin. He is hands down yeah. my favorite glass blower, pipe maker specifically, and artist. You know, all in all, him, Alex Tuba. I love his um, his big like uh, ne- those neon light sculptures. Mm-hmm. Um, Buck. I mean, he's just a fucking animal. 
Yeah, man. It's what's funny with Buck is he's one of those artists that really stays under the radar. Oh yeah. You know, which Dude, I, whenever he posts something, I freak out. I'm like, oh, what is he posting right now? You yeah, know what I mean, it's interesting. You know, it's which as as an amazing talented artist as he is, he's just you know it does his thing up in the fucking woods. I I, I love his work. So yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, he's a wook in the woods blowing glass, huh? Yeah, pretty much, dude. <laughs> Super fucking talented. But Brandon Martin oh, too, man. He's yeah. he's one of my faves. He's he's to me he's one of those well-rounded artists that dabbles in a lot of different mediums and oh, yeah. and and does a lot of things that I've wanted to do like make toys and stuff, you know? Like I think it's just it's it's pretty fucking badass. Yeah, like he can make niche things pretty much and then he can be like, "Oh, I have uh, this big bronze casted rhino with, you know, fully sculptural mixed media alien writing it yeah you know what that's I mean? what i was gonna bring up like that's one of my favorite things he's ever done and it's i saw it in Same person at, at veretta down in west palm or whatever that music gallery is down there and uh god it's just fucking... i think the piece's name is urse ursi or something that sounds right Ursula? yeah something like that that's my favorite piece he's ever made yeah man it inspired me like i, I started doing these native american heads and i was making like like real headdresses for them you know just for fun and Hell yeah. it was just you know, one of those things. You know, I was like, this is, it's cool. And that, and I think that's what's so much fun with our industry is just, there's so much talent and inspiration. It's yeah. Awesome. It's like, I don't know. Yeah, for sure. Hell yeah. So, uh, number two is what are your top five favorite colors in glass? Top five favorite colors. Amber purple is number one. Hell yeah. Hands down. Um, Jeez, I don't know. Fucking, let's see, we got amber, purple, mystery, adventuring, slime. Sun, honestly, sunset slime has been a pretty favorite one of mine right now. Oh, I never used it. Never even knew it existed. Yeah, CFL slime. It's like it goes from regular slime to a pink slime, pretty much. Gnarly. Yeah, it's a really cool color. It's super buttery. I like it. Um. Yeah. Uh. Shit, I don't know. I always, I, I just buy like random shit when I get glass. Oh, I get amber purple every single time I buy glass. So, oh yeah, so that's definitely number one. Uh, I mean, I always get jet black. You know, mm-hmm. I feel like you always have that black. Uh, shit. You got one more. One more. I don't know. Uh, clear. Okay, there you go. Works. Shit, yeah. Oh right, well, I mean, actually, I could I use a fucking. Hot shop color? I'd have to say yeah. Adventure Inn, dude. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's uh I made a I did like a switch axis and combo vase with that color and it's out uh, that's one of the most beautiful colors in glass I feel like. Yeah, it looks amazing over like cobalts and those kind of things. Like it's just so pretty. Yeah, I didn't I just did an overlay over clear with it. Oh nice. Okay. Yeah. It's really cool. I don't know. I love it. Yeah, and it's easy to fuck up. Oh yeah, I fuck my last piece of the year. I fucking flopped on itself in the glory hole, and that was a mess. That was a, that's a whole another story. Did dude. you touch like the inside of the glory hole? Well, no. It was get. I was making. Um, I was gonna make a, a like a big bowl because I need a fruit bowl, and um, I was in there and I'm talking to my friend Patty, and we're sitting here blowing glass. She's assisting me. And it's already pretty thin. I look over and it's getting floppy. I'm like, oh shit, open the door, open the door. And as I go to open it, just like caught, it caught the lips caught each other. Oh and yeah. Yeah. We <clears> saved <throat> it. We ended up like re, like re, reworking it and then just turned it into a floppy bowl. So, nice. but it's got this really disgusting looking overlap on the fucking top, but I'm, I'm not trying to sell it. I'm going to keep it. So hell yeah. Yeah. Add to the collection of misfit glass. Yeah, dude, I have like too much glass everywhere. It's just a dust. It collects the dust. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It really does. Like my kitchen table is full of vases right now. I feel bad. I'm like my roommates can't really sit there and eat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, that's funny. I don't know. Should I drill... give my friends glass, and they're just like, Jake, stop giving us fucking glass. Like, drill some holes in them, man. Them. Make some bongs out of them and sell them. Yeah, right. Honestly, I could with some of them. Yeah. I need I need to sell. I haven't really sold any of my hot shop stuff. I don't know. Huh. Like I said, I'm terrible at marketing. I just like blowing glass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that. 
Uh, number three is uh, what's your worst injury in the studio? Um, I mean, I guess I guess it would be this one because I still have a scar. Um, I was doing mushroom pendants. Like I was probably, I was probably like six months in on the torch. I'm definitely under a year. I'm doing mushroom pendant, mushroom pendants. You know what I mean? Where you just have a stringer and you're jam it in the clear mm-hmm. you know what i mean and um it was way too cold snapped off the whole color went into my thumb mm. and sitting there dangling and i pulled it out and I, I had glass in my thumb for i don't know half a year had a lot of problems with it but ended up pushing its way out now i have a gnarly scar there it's yeah. amazing how your body rejects that stuff Dude, it's insane, and like it'll be out of nowhere. You're like, oh shit, that fucking hurts all of a sudden. Yeah. And then your body just pushes it out, and I'm like, wow, cool, thank you, human nature. Yeah, it's so weird. I had a piece of my foot for like two years probably, and I could never get it out. And eventually, it, like, ate a hole in my foot, like where the glass oh. just like dissolved itself, and I had like a little cavity. Yeah, it was really oh, strange. Damn. Yeah, it yeah, was like right is- in the pad of my foot under my toe, you know, kind of area. <clears throat> so yeah, I have. That's like, a, a miserable place to have some fucking glass. Yeah, oh, it was. I was a dumbass, though. I didn't wear shoes for, like, two years. Like, literally didn't wear shoes for two years. Like, I'd go to a grocery store. I didn't give a fuck. And uh, <laughs> he included working nice. at my buddy's studio. And, and Daniel, his his studio was in his basement, and his basement was exposed to the outside. So, like, the front of his house was underground, but the back was, like, wide open, you know, because of how the slope of his yard was. Right. So he would just, like, knock his bubble trash off into his fan. It would blow. I mean, I don't know. It was, like, the... the crazy shit ever so like his backyard was like a minefield of fucking glass shards and shit and oh my god you know, i was always barefoot everywhere so I'd, yeah i always had glass on my feet i mean i'm in my I studio now homies, barefoot. Uh, i had a couple homies that did a couple years of barefoot too that's funny yeah i recommend it I, mine started after high school i went down to the keys for six weeks and didn't wear shoes and this parking lot we had was like a oyster bed shell kind of thing so like my feet got pretty tough and from that point on, I'm like, oh, I guess I don't need shoes anymore. I got built-in soles right now. Hell yeah, you callous up yeah. your feet like a motherfucker. Yeah. Yeah, it took me probably five years of going to get uh, pedicures done to for them to grind that shit off. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, man. And now that I wear shoes, for the most part, I have uh, nice, smooth baby feet. Nice. Except for my heels. Yeah, I wear, I wear some shitty shoes all the time. I, I need to get some good shoes. I only own one pair of shoes, and... They're falling apart. <laughs> yeah, that's the way of life, I guess, right? Yeah, good shoes in the studio, though, are definitely important. I mean, I sit down at work on the lathe all day, and then when I'm in the studio, I stand, mm-hmm. and I feel it in the studio. Because I, I have flat vans, you know what I mean? Oh, They're that's the worst. Apart. Yeah. Dude, I know, man. Trust me. And I have a bad knee. I had knee surgery um, in 2013. And, like, I never took care of it after that. And, like, I have problems. You know what I mean? What was it, like, orthoscopic shit or was it ACL or something? It, I tore my ACL skiing. And um, so I have a cadaver in my knee now. Okay. But, yeah, it fucking suck. But Yeah, if you, anybody out there that has any kind of knee issues and you get it surgery, follow up with physical therapy. Because I did the same uh, shit. I, I, dude, definitely do it. Because yeah. I regret not doing that. And I regret not taking care of my knee after the fact. And I saying that right now i should probably do some fucking yoga or go for a walk but you know what i mean just t- you got to take care of your body man especially when you're blowing glass dude. you know even if you have ventilation you're still breathing in fumes you're still breathing shit in like you're around glass dust in your studio mm-hmm. it's like you got to take care of your body eat healthy take care of yourself yeah and i'm, I'm one to talk dude i smoke cigarettes i like you know oh man whatever. really the fuck? yeah i need to fucking I'm twenty. I'm twenty four. I'll figure it out. I guess. Man, it's 2019, almost. Yeah, new year, new me, man. Here we go. Yeah, yeah. Get off that shit. I know. No, I need to trust me. I tried quitting a while ago too, and I like I went to the vape, like the Joel thing, and that just made it worse. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, if you just tell yourself that every time you put a cigarette in your mouth, you're putting a pacifier in your mouth, or you're like Linus carrying around his little blankie all day, then uh, maybe you'll quit. Essentially, that's what it is, dude. Oh, have them, have them on me twenty four seven. That's how I look at it, man. Look at it; it's like a, it's yep. a little security blanket. It helps to cure boredom, and actually, he's gonna. That is, for, that's very true. Slowly killing you. Helps, yeah, and it helps stink you up too. Oh yeah, Kills yeah. Your sense of smell, fucking. Yeah, man. If you like to eat, all the time. Yeah, absolutely. 
You can't taste food the same. None of that shit. No, oh, that's yeah. <clears throat> Damn, dude, you're making me upset now. I gotta fucking quit. Good. <laughs> Fuck, <dude. laughs> it's like damn i feel like shit now uh, god if, if you're a smoker out there you're a fucking moron <laughs> <laughs> facts honestly uh, I, gotta quit. I, I all my friends that smoke dude i'm like if y'all want to quit let me know because i will grab your ass for every day until you fucking quit they're like dude that's gonna make me want to smoke more dude, like, i used to be like that too and then i started smoking and then it was like yeah I just grew up around it like my mom smoked. Oh, shit, you're cutting out. Oh, uh, yeah, you cut out for a second, too. You still there? Hello, hello, hello. You hear me? Yep. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I, right. just, I just heard myself in the feedback. Cool. <clears throat> but, yeah, man, like, like I grew up in, with my mom smoking most of my childhood. And uh, when I went to go live, live with my dad in middle school, I didn't really realize, like, how bad I stunk every fucking day going to school until I moved out of there and actually had, like, non-cigarette-smelling clothes <clears throat> so yeah did so, they smoke in the house oh my mom did yeah she didn't give a shit yeah that yeah. shit will stain your walls too man oh dude it's so gross yeah like the walls just are like caked with like a yellow film yeah oh dude wow i'm i'm gonna throw this pack away boy. it's gonna suck for like two weeks but you'll get past it yeah i went longest i went cold turkey was probably three months I've been smoking for a long time. Not a long time, I guess, but. Yeah. Seven, seven, yeah, whatever. My bad. I'm, yeah. Just don't replace it with M&Ms because then you'll get fat. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very, like, jittery person, too. I'm very ADD. So I feel like smoking cigarettes definitely helps me. But now it's just like the nicotine's there. And I'd have to I would have to find an alternative. When I did cold turkey, I, I used toothpicks, man. I was chewing toothpicks like a motherfucker. Huh. And that worked. It definitely worked, but I don't know. I ran out of toothpicks, and then I started smoking again. Yeah, it's that whole hand-to-mouth habit kind of a... Uh... Yeah, it's like, the, it's like the oral fixation of it, you know? Well, some, stick some dicks in your mouth, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'll go I'll hop, in the, hop in the studio, make some dillies, and just walk around with a pack of dillies. <laughs> there we go. A couple of broken teeth later, you're like, yeah, definitely, I'm glad I quit. <laughs> like oh shit <laughs> oh fuck off topic here all right back on track so uh yeah so got the worst injury out of the way which fucking sucks and uh yeah so in the studio do you uh we kind of covered it already but do you listen to the stu- uh, radio uh, watch tv or do you do both um i don't i don't watch tv i blow glass no we don't have tv in there and any of my students who never had TV. And I don't know. I feel like it would distract me. If I'm, like, doing the same thing over and over and over and over all day long, yeah, I could probably watch TV. But, yeah, I, I don't do that. Um, I um, at, When I'm at work, I listen to podcasts for sure. Um, it helps just keep the day moving. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, like, I listen to your podcast. I listen to Tang- Tangentially Speaking with Christopher Ryan. I fucking love that one. Um, Joe Rogan, of course, your mom's house with Tom Segura and Christina Pajinski. Um, a bunch. I got like a lot, but, um, and then when I'm at my shop, I listen to music for sure. Nice. Yeah. It helps to, so, I guess it depends. I don't know. Sometimes it's, I'm quiet. Just when I don't put anything on or I'll start the morning off with a podcast and then put some music on. And, you know, I've been really into jam bands recently the past few months. Man, watch out for that Grateful Dead, man. They will change your life. Yeah, dude. I mean, I've been on a heavy kick of pigeons playing ping pong right now. Nice. Never heard of them before, but I've, I've um, like listened to it before, but I've heard the band, the name of the band before. Yeah, if you like jam bands, man, you should definitely fucking definitely give them a shout. I'm going to write it down. Pigeons playing or, uh, ping pong. Yeah, yeah they're, they're out of Baltimore. Yeah, I don't think they tour out west, but they tour out east. Yeah, you're in Florida, you know. Yeah. I was supposed to be going to see them in Philly. Uh, January 25th or something. They're playing like two days in a row. Nice. A uh, podcast I could recommend for you, I was turned on to, uh, it's called Stuff That'll Blow Your Mind. <clears throat> Stuff That'll Blow Your Mind? Oh, uh, dude, it's fucking awesome. Uh, uh, no, it's called Stuff To Blow Your Mind. And, Here, uh, let me write that down. Yeah. They, My uh, bad. What is it? Stuff To Blow Your Mind? Yep. Yeah, and they they, ha- they have a variety of shows. Uh, a new one they just started. One is called Invention, which I started listening to last night. But uh, yeah, like the last episode I listened to on 
the uh, stuff to blow your mind was on they they did like some Christmas themed versions, so that it was on uh, uh, the Virgin Birth, but it was on animals that can reproduce without uh, sex, basically, which is called parthenogenesis. Uh, well, parthenogenesis is the term, and uh, it was fascinating shit. Yeah, what the fuck? I'm definitely gonna give that a listen. Yes, shit. dude. Yeah, it's cool. Some of the shit they talk about is like really fucking out there. But, uh, like, they did a whole series on the Ark of the Covenant and how it could have been a modern day at the time uh, warfare kind of uh, made type of thing. Uh, like, because I guess it created some kind of electricity of some sort. Like, oh. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, it says, uh, what if the Ark of the Covenant was actually a bronze aged machine capable of storing an electrostatic charge? Oh, what the fuck? Yeah, it says it almost certainly wasn't, but the idea is a great excuse to explore the understanding of electricity in the ancient world. So, yeah, it's like, again, like I said, it's, I mean, it's literally the show says everything what it is about, stuff that'll blow your mind. You're just like, what the fuck? How long, how long are each episode? Uh, they range anywhere from uh, an hour to a few hours. Yeah, that's definitely the type of podcast I like listening to for sure. And then Invention has five episodes they just started with, and the first one is on the invention of the vending machine. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Yeah. It's... That's that's my worst nightmare right there, dude. I need, like, four bags of Doritos. <laughs> 75 cents each. I'm like, fuck it, dude. I got a few bucks to do this. That The vending machine is what started my downward spiral from uh, going from having almost a six-pack to now I have back to my little bit of a gut again. <laughs> True. Yeah. Eating candy? Well, I would hit the vending machine, like, because I would have my long drives when I was doing my commute to St. Pete back and forth. So, like, I would hit the vending machine and get, like, a Three Musketeers, and then I would get, uh, true. you know, and then, like, they started selling, like, a full package of cookies in them. So, I would, like, buy a whole pack of cookies for, like, $1.25, and, like, Oreos for me is, like, the worst thing ever I can have. Like, I can't, Oreos and candy, uh, candy corn are two things I cannot have ever again in my life. Dude, that's how I am with Skittles. If you, if there's a bag of Skittles in front of me, they're gone. Yeah. And like, oh my god, dude. And I wake up the next day, my mouth hurts. I'm like, I feel like shit. Yeah, shit and rainbows. Ugh. Yeah, literally, man. Shit. Yeah, no fun. Man, we get all kind of off topic here. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, my bad, dude. I'm, no, about it's, I'm, I'm instigating it, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> talking about dicks in your mouth and shit and rainbows. Yeah. I mean, fuck, this is an awesome episode. Yeah, we're getting getting real uh, 2019 up in here. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, number five or whatever at number we're on is uh, if you could describe the sound of glass cracking in one word, whether like the actual sound of it or like a uh, metaphorical, you know, feeling that it creates in your body, uh, what would it be? Uh, that was it. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, fuck. Like, you know what I mean? Just, yeah. uh, you know, I don't know. I don't, it's like definitely not a good sound to hear. Mm -hmm. I made that same noise the other day. I'm working on this uh, big ass paperweight for a guest and the base of it was like the thicker part. And I put a punny on there and got everything cleaned up and go to in my kiln. And it was just close enough to my door where it wasn't fully hot, you know? And I just heard that chunk. So, uh, yeah. So I made that noise out loud to myself and, People probably heard me. I ignored that. Yeah, that's the worst, man. <laughs> it's the fuck, especially when you're when I'm in the hot shop working and like when you're going to take off that punny, like take your punny off and like crack it off. I've been like getting better at not having this issue, but still I have this issue. It's like you go to take it off, punny's too cold, so then the bottom of your piece cracks, and like every time I'm like I hit it once, I hit it twice. All right, so I grab the paddle, hit the back of the, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Hit the back of the pipe, try not to crack it. And then it just checks around the whole piece, and I'm just like, ah, oh, just throw it away. Fuck. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Oh, man. What took me a while to get used to was just the sound of the glass popping off the moils when we would have them in our bucket <clears throat> as they would cool down between demos. And, like, even the guests would hear it, and they're like, oh, my God, what just happened? Yeah, yeah. right. And it's like a little frag, a little silica grenade. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's see. Ch -ch 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 we got the glass artist colors injury sound of glass shit in uh, there. So I guess there's six questions. I don't Where? know unless I missed. I one. forgot we were doing these questions. It's all good. That's the that's, yeah, the, that's the whole goal. It's a, <laughs> <Of course. laughs> 
<laughs> so the last question is, uh, what are your top five favorite tools in the studio to use? Word. Besides um, your torch and, and uh, your glasses. Word. Um, yeah, I guess I have tweezer jacks that I've been using for the last, like, four years. Three years, maybe? Probably three years. And I made them myself out of tweezers, uh, and they're awesome. I don't, like, don't like using a reamer that much. Mm-hmm. I just it's it's so it flows you know wax them up flow it so uh, my bad I'm like tangent here uh, I was yeah about, I was about I to start singing a song like wax it up spin it rub it down oh no whatever that <laughs> oh but yeah yeah tweezer jacks um my Elmarver love that fucking thing mm-hmm. um I don't really use a lot of tools I guess my tweezers you know I got my hand torch. My little Smith Little, which I just fucking broke the tip on the other day. Mm, it sucks. Literally three days ago. I dropped it, and I just stepped on it. Oh. Yeah, I'm pretty upset about that. I don't even want to talk about it, actually. But um, I can do one. Uh, what, is that four? I think. It's four? My bad. Uh, tweezer jacks, L Marber, hand torch, regular tweezers. Uh, yeah, one more. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh kiln dude i mean cool yeah you gotta blow glass with a kiln there you go you know yep yeah minimal amount of minimal tools is always a good thing yeah i mean i have like you know my paddle my reamer a couple reamers and then you know some diamond shears shears but i don't use i don't the the, the ones i just said are what i use every single time at least when i'm on the torch you know yeah 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 that was a goal not quite my hand torch but still you know do you find like using the hand torch in the shop was a good crossover from the hot shop, like from hot shop to you know hand torch to then you're on the you know lamp working studio hand torch. What and t- and uh, using a hand torch in the hot shop? Yeah, just like in general, like not really using a hand torch for what we do in the on you know lamp working wise, <clears throat> but just to just having a hand torch in your hand while you're working with glass. It's just a weird. I don't know. For me, it was a weird thing at first, but I got used to. Yeah, you're talking about using it in the hot shop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Um, I I don't know. I like it. You know, honestly, when I'm in the hot shop and I'm using, and I have a nice little hand torch there. It's, I enjoy it. I think it, it's nice. If my pipe's getting too cold or my moil's getting too cold, I'm like, dude, fuck the bushy torch. Let me raise this thing real quick. You yeah, know. Yeah. Or you're doing applications. It's like I feel like um, doing applications in the hot shop where you have your hand torch there. Be from using my hand torch in the flame studio so often and like you know putting horns on pieces melting them in and shit you know being able to know how to do that and then coming to the hot shop put an application on, i feel like it's made it way easier to really have an understanding of that yeah you yeah know? i guess that was kind of what my my question was leading towards <clears throat> Where, yeah my bad if i oh no you're I'm good really, yeah my bad uh, it was a confusing question so it's all good i'm bad at answering questions in general either it's probably why i'm as f- failed out of school so (laughs) (laughs) uh hell yeah dude well before we let you go here if you want to uh give us a little bit of a parting piece of advice and then where we can find you out there in the world of cyberspace yeah i mean um i don't know keep doing you man just you're passionate about something whether it's glass whatever just do it manifest it just get motivated you know nobody else is going to do it for you you're the only person who's living your own life so fucking do it and, uh, you know, make art with your friends, motivate your friends, push them, lift them up, criticize them. Just don't put them down, obviously, but, um, yeah, stay humble, I guess. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, just be the best you and blow glass. Hell yeah. Good shit. And where can we find you in cyberspace? Yeah, uh, Instagram, man. I deleted Facebook a little while ago. It's too much social media for my brain. So Instagram, Jake spins glass, just all one word. Uh, yeah, that's me. Sweet. Yeah, fuck yeah. Well, yeah, dude. It's uh again. Hang on till uh after. I'll say the outro here and whatever. Yeah, they, dude. Thanks, thanks very much for having me on here, man. I've been a big fan of the show and everything, and hell yeah. I yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, me too, bro. It's it's uh it's fun to have a multifaceted glass artist on here besides, you know, just being a, a pipe maker, someone that's you know I mean, you're literally covering all the bases from the 
the torch to the scientific to the hot shop. So it's, uh, you know, the thing you're really missing is stained glass or fusing or something. Yeah, I, dude, I can't get into fusing, man. It's too slow for me. Yeah, it, it, I don't like doing things that machines do for you kind of deal. Yeah, no, for sure. But I have respect for it, so don't get me wrong. Yeah, I, absolutely, I, I dude. Glass it. is glass. I, I love silica. Yeah. Fire it up. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Thank you again, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. And I hope you all enjoy this episode, this little early on chit chat here and uh, kicking this new year off on the right foot. And uh, yeah, so I hope you enjoy the rambles and these rambles will continue throughout the year and uh, with lots more fun episodes coming up. But in the meantime, definitely go check out uh, Jake on Instagram at Jake Spins Glass. I'll have all those links and the information in the show notes for you guys, as well as a lot of the links that we talked about from the, uh, the Corning Glass Barge to uh, any of the glass artists that we brought up and what have you. And until next time, stay uh, happy and hydrated and comfortable in your studios. Have a wise day. Talk to you soon. Peace. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Since its inception, the focus of The Flow has been to provide a bond among members of the lampworking community. This has been accomplished by developing relationships with the finest artists and sharing their techniques with you through in-depth, step-by-step tutorials. In every issue, you can enjoy great content with the hottest artists and cutting-edge techniques using the latest industry products. These features, along with the continuation of our Women in Glass edition, Glass Craft Emergent Artist Awards, inspiring gallery showcases, dynamic general interest articles, as well as health and safety information, make The Flow the leading international lampworking journal. For more information or to subscribe to The Flow, go to theflowmagazine.com. That's theflowmagazine.com.